I'll stay out of the frame in that case. Is that okay? I'll stay, around, I'll stay out of the frame in that case. Uh, it's good. It's good. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to the venue four of the uh, DSS IT Sec uh, 2016, the largest annual security conference and exhibition in Baltics. We'll have uh, we have great lineup of eight speakers, and uh, today main topic in this venue is going to be data leaks and protection, as uh, the time is of essence. We will try to stick to the uh, schedule you have uh, in your programs, and uh, we'll have two coffee breaks in between the speakers. But now, uh, let's, let's start with the first presentation. Um, we have Tarun Samtani, who is going to talk about what is DLP and uh, why should you have it. And we have agreed that uh, the question time is going to be after the presentation. We'll have about five minutes of that. All right? Yeah. The perfect. floor is Thank all you. yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction there. Early morning, everyone. It's been a great morning actually being here really because it's when I got here last night, it was absolutely gorgeous. Late last night, it was around half 11 when I got here, I was coming over to the hotel. It was beautiful, really quiet, really nice lights and around it's beautiful city actually. It's my first time in Latvia, so really happy to be here actually. Great to be here. So yeah, my name's Tarun, as he's already mentioned. Uh, I probably want to thank you, thank all the pr uh, producers and the sponsors actually to be having me here. Really glad to be here as well. So the topic actually uh, I want to talk about is more around data security, data loss prevention. That's what the topic is about actually. So let you, to give you a bit of a quick introduction of my background, what my background looks like. So that's me when I was five years old actually. And that's the uniform of an Indian police actually. So I wanted to be a police officer that means. Never got there of course really. So anyway, but uh, yeah. That's how things are, that's my Twitter name, that's my mobile number really, that's my <laughs> personal mobile number there. So I've been in, in working in, I started my career in around 1999. Uh, started with IT, doing systems, networks, security, working on different technologies basically, and that's how I started. And been working on the business role in the last many years now. So this is what I enjoy, this is what my passion is, and this is why I'm here. So. Next year, I'm, I'm in the process of writing a book, which will be published uh, probably some point in the summer of next year. So looking forward to it as well. Quick overview on the agenda. So the agenda is about DLP. DLP stands for data loss prevention, data leakage prevention, uh, as you may already know about it. Just by the quick show of hands, how many of you actually are using DLP technologies in, in the businesses you work for, or you are on the journey of you know, having DLP in, in your business. Anyone yet at all? Brilliant, brilliant, that's good to know. That's good to know actually. So yeah, you're more than happy to you know, share your experiences at a later, later point or in the between, if you, whatever you like, it's, it's up to you. And so, quick agenda, what is DLP? Why should you have it? Uh, how do you build a strategy for you know, having DLP in your business, and uh, some key takeaways for it. Now, if you're like me, who worries about data loss all the time, causing you hair loss, well, I can't give you any tips for hair loss. I can definitely give you some tips for data loss in that case. So what is DLP? DLP is more about a strategy of doing things on how to minimize the loss of data in your business. It's, think of it as actually sort of a, in a way, a strategy to build your security around data because the traditional network perimeters don't work. I mean, traditionally, if you think about it, we've been doing all the network things like firewalls, IDSs, and all the different technologies in place to protect our perimeters. But that definitely hasn't worked because we still see breaches all the time. So the focus is actually more around the data now rather than actually, you know, just the perimeter. Perimeter is the basic still really. You still have to do it, of course, but that doesn't stop any of those hackers to get, your, get access to your data. So this is why it, there has to be more focus towards data-centric approach 
which is around the data itself. So data is a new perimeter if you think about it. TLP is more about a combination of people, process, technology. So as any other uh, information security process, it's, it's again a process basically. It's, about, it's all about a combination. You can't just have a technology and you know, protect the data itself. Just that wouldn't work really. You have to have a mix of everything. I'm gonna go about the next few slides anyways about it. So Ernest and Young actually did some research a couple of years ago on all the different breaches which have taken part, taken, you know, happened in the last few years. And the root causes of some of the breaches were actually related to these, some of these areas really. So lack of awareness in the people, which means the awareness programs which you have in the business you know, were one of the causes that it wasn't covering enough or probably it wasn't enough for how to protect or how to guide people on how to protect the data itself. So that could be one of the major causes actually in that case. In terms of process, you know, not, people not knowing about how to handle the sensitive data is again one of the main root causes there. If they don't know what is sensitive data, if they know how to actually protect them, you definitely you have a problem there. Technology, of course, if you haven't got the right technology in place, it wouldn't work again, really. So technology is as much important, really, there. Uh, Gartner did a sort of a, a survey, actually. They released a survey about information security spending forecasts, and DLP is one of the major or the biggest uh, investments through 2020. In fact, 90% of the organizations are already looking to implement some form of integrated DLP. Does anybody know any integrated DLP actually what it is really around here? There's two major categories of DLP. So there is, if you look at this, if you speak to vendors, they will talk about enterprise DLP generally. Integrated DLP is a feature set which comes with some other data security products. Who over here actually uses Office 365 in their environment? Any of you? Office 365 Outlook here? So in, in, in those, basically, you get some, if you have a license, say E3 license, you get some basic feature set anyways with Office 365. That's basically integrated DLP. So any integrated uh, feature set which comes with some, some of the technologies is actually more about integrated DLP. Isaka did a survey earlier this year which came to point that social engineering and the insider and cyber threats were the major concerns for the businesses. And that's absolutely true. If you think about the links people click on and get infected is quite a lot. And this is how most of the cybercrime actually starts or initiates, nearly 94% of it. Probably I would say over the 90% actually starts that way. So it's a major concern. Talk about insider threats. There could be probably a few different types, of course. There's one who is the, probably you know, the malicious one. Say, suppose someone is leaving the business, they, they try and carry away all the data with them, you know, whatever they've been working on for the past years. That is a risk to the business. So that's an insider threat in that case. The negligent, probably I would say uninformed, if the people are not informed enough to how to protect the data, they could probably lose it by accident, just by negligence. That's the ins negligent insider there. And the credential thief, so that those are the ones who are the external probably hackers, criminals, who send across emails, phishing emails, try and you know, compromise the workstation, seal the credentials, and they are as good as being an insider in that case. So that's these kind of three kind of... Pornmon did a sort of a research on this actually and came out that 68% of the uh, incidents which happened in the organizations in the US were cause of employee or contractor negligence. Again, uninformed staff. So again, that's something very crucial there. 22% malicious and probably only 10% were the ones which are credential thief. Now, if you look at the cost side of it, of course, the, because of the high numbers on an annual basis, the business, it, was, it, would, it would cost more to the business in terms of employee or uninformed uh, employee negligence. So, and the criminal, of course, were less than that. The per incident cost to the business was actually more on the credential thief than, than the, any, any else. So Pornman Institute did a research and they found, they, they suggested some of the insider uh, things you can do actually and activities you can do to prevent the insider risk. The, on the top stands the DLP. And the second stands the mandatory user training and awareness. In fact, the mandatory training and user, user awareness, I'm covering that topic actually later on this afternoon again in one of the sessions. So, 
how do we go about building a strategy for securing data or you know, sort of data loss prevention? Think about data like this. Most of the organizations have around 20% of the structured data in there, probably between 20 to 30%. It's hard to assess exactly, but around between 20 to 30%. 70 to 80% is actually unstructured, which means it sits across all the different systems in the business, in different departments, and in documents, PDFs, images, those kind of files ready. Now, the 20%, you know exactly where it lives generally. Most of the organizations are aware about it because they generally would live in systems, you know, some kind of databases, data warehouses. So those are the ones, there are controls in place for that. Whereas for the unstructured, if you think about it, there's hardly any controls because we are relying on the network perimeter, they're relying on the endpoint security solutions, which probably don't help enough because if a user clicks on something malicious, that system was gonna be infected. So it doesn't help enough in that case. So you gotta do more around the unstructured in that respect. And you really can't protect something what you don't know. And the 80% is more of the what you generally don't know. So for a program, actually, for a program like a data security program, you've got to have some objectives in place. So some of these objectives you probably would have already in place. First question you want to ask is, what are we trying to protect here? Where does it live? Who has access to it? Who is the owner for it? There has to be someone accountable for that data, for protecting the data, securing the data. Who has access to it? You need to know that. You need to know all these questions. You need to know the answers to all these questions. And what are they doing with it? Unless you don't know about this, it's difficult to keep tap on all the data around the business. It's not easy enough. So ideally, your data security program should look like something like this. You go to discover your data. Without discovery, you actually wouldn't know what, your, what data you have, where it lives, and how it is, on what systems. You go to classify it. Classifying is all about making sure you put right controls in place for the right types of data. So if you are bound by some regulatories, you probably would be, uh, say, suppose it's a PCR regulatory you're bound by, you, you would know that you've got to take care of the credit card data. You, you know that you've got to take care of the customer data. So you, unless you classify that data, it's a confidential data, it's a sensitive data, you generally don't know how to put some controls around that in that case. So classification is absolutely crucial there. Again, that's where the security technologies come in place. In DLP, there are there is many different technologies you can probably uh, use in your business. It could be data loss prevention tools, it could be rights management, could be all those areas, really encryption and all those areas. And then you've got to monitor that, of course. Once you know what your sec secure, sensitive data is, you've secured that, you've got to monitor it to ensure that it doesn't leak, it doesn't, you don't lose that. So talking about technologies, Generally, if you speak to vendors, these are the two categories of technologies uh, you probably would hear from them. Most of them actually, the big vendors out there do enterprise DLP, which is comprehensive solutions, portfolio of products. They would talk about data in motion technology, they talk about data in rest, data at rest and in use technologies really. So they are full blown appliances, software, depending on what, what you look at. So they are full blown solutions. Integrate, again, as I mentioned before, it's more about a feature set that comes in addition to the products which you already be using or which you probably look for. So that's the integrated DLP. It might probably might find them in secure web gateways, secure encryption gateways, and the CASB, which is the cloud access security brokers. So most of these CASB brokers actually, how many of you have heard about CASB really actually, the cloud access security broker? It's a fairly new sort of uh, concept in terms of Gartner actually because it's been there for still a few years now. There is, it's about protecting your data in the cloud, what goes on in the cloud, actually. So focusing on the different areas of uh, data, when you look at the technologies, you would see technologies in these three areas. So whether it be in data in motion, which would protect data from all these kind of uh, in motion ways. So you might have a network DLP product for that. You might have endpoint product for data in REST or you might have, again, endpoint, different separate endpoint product for data and use. So these are the three categories. Talking about implementation, now DLP is a massively disruptive process, business process. It does, when you have DLP in place, technology in place, it can actually, it has, it can stop data being transferred from one 
process to the other, another business process. So you've got to be really careful when you actually implement that. You've got to have a good plan for it. Make sure you do good, have a long monitoring sort of a focus on it. So before you implement policies on your DLP technologies, you've got to ensure that you monitor it for a good long time to understand all the data flows and then start preventing it or stopping it. Because otherwise, it will actually stop a lot in the business in that case. And you definitely don't want your unhappy users in that respect. So just to summarize the whole of this, these are the different elements you would want to look at in a, in a DLP program, or any data security program, in fact, in this case. I'm just taking an example of DLP in this one. So the compliance, understand what regulatory body is actually you, you're liable to, really. Could be PCI, could be uh, financial services uh, authority. Once you know exactly who you're going to be responsible to, really, in terms of data, you need to understand what your data types are. So data types could be car data, could be customer data, could be one of those, really, or could be anything else, really, in that case, depending on your industry as well, of course. Do a risk assessment of it. Understand what is the risk, actually, if you lose that, or how can, could you lose that. Build some policies around it. How are you going to protect it? You need to have some policies. How are you going to classify it? How are you going to handle that data, sensitive data itself? Build some policies. Once you have some policies, you need to make your staff aware about it because the staff actually sort of work with your data, sends the data all the time. They need, to be understand, they need to understand basically how you're going to classify and how they're going to be handling it. If it's a sensor data, they need to be aware about that. So awareness is a key over there. Discovery, this could be one of the places you could, depending on the size of your business, if you're a small to medium business, you could probably do it by yourself in a manual way. But if you are probably a larger business or a medium to large business, then you want to look at some kind of technologies. There are many technologies out there who do all these discovery tools and discovery softwares, really. So you want to discover the data. Once you've discovered the data, you want to classify it. You need to understand what is going to be your sensitive data so you can put controls mainly around those kind of data which is most crucial for you. Understand the governance, basically, of it, really. So who has access to it? Build a governance model around it. Who is going to be the owner for that data or for that data type or for that particular in the business? So, and who has access to it? Understand all about that. Remediation, this is where the different tools come in place. So whether it be DLP or whether it be rights management or any other tools, actually, encryption tools, this is where your tools come in place. So you want to put some policies in place on how you're going to be remediating it. So if you found some data somewhere which is sensitive that lives on systems, what are you going to do with it? You've got to have some policies in place. You've got to have some rules in place to understand what you're going to do with that, whether you're going to be encrypting it, whether you're going to be moving it to a central location, or you're going to be uh, using some DLP tools for that. So key takeaways from me in that respect. Uh, the first thing. Discover and classify your data. That's absolutely crucial for data security. Generally, what I've seen in, in, from, in working in different organizations in the past, when we talk about DLP, most of the organizations go and try and find buy you know, technologies first, rather than doing this step first. It's very crucial to do this step first before you go and buy some technology. Plot a life cycle of your data. Understand how the data flows in your business. How does it actually get created? How does it get shared, stored, and works, and flows around the different business processes? This is a, absolutely a key, really, because unless you understand how data is flowing in your business, you don't know how you're going to be protecting it, where you're going to be putting the right controls in place for it. So you need to understand the whole life cycle of your data in the business. Update your policies. Again, once you know exactly what your data, sensitive data, looks like, you need to update it, your policies to say that how you're going to classify that kind of data, how you're going to uh, handle that data. So it's, it's a key for the business as well, for the users, for the staff to understand how they're going to be handling it. Create some awareness around it. Run sessions. So before even putting in technology in place, make sure that get, you get the users, the staff on board with it. You need to have that first. Deploy the technology in waves. So do it in different ways, waves, really, because unless if you do it full-blown, buy some technologies, put in place, it will block, it will stop a lot of business processes. So make sure you go through a long monitoring phase. I've heard some organizations, in fact, do something like six months to even 18 months of monitoring, just monitoring, to understand what the policy is, to understand all the different ways of it. Lastly, 
build a gap analysis, do a gap analysis of it really, understand the compliance, if it meets the standards, understand all of that, see what your gaps are from all these technologies and things, and then start reviewing it, going through the process again, the same process I mentioned again last. That's my contact details. If you need, if you have any questions, I'm here all day today, and I'm going to be around for the next couple of days in, in Riga itself. If you've got any questions, feel free to connect, ask me, and more than happy. If you've got any questions now, I'm happy to answer. We've got a few minutes left, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the question time is now. Uh, you've been very precise. We have a few minutes left. Um, this is the time. If you have any questions for Tarun, no, no, no. Okay, you've been very clear then. Brilliant. I guess. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Just a uh, just a small gift from uh, from from the conference. Thank you. Thank you, so Thank you so much. And there is the invitation for the after party as well. Actually, two. Oh, is it? Two invitations. Oh, yes. Yeah. So. Now you know uh, Tarun by his face, if you see him, yeah, that, that would be great if you give it to me back. Now everyone knows your face and uh, if, if they have some, Latvians are a little bit shy sometimes. That's at least what uh, people say about us. Um, and uh, so, but yeah, everyone knows you now and if uh, somebody has uh, any questions then it's, going to be easy to ask them now. Okay. Um, now we have a little pause between the presentations. So that one is going to be around. <laughs> He's not leaving. What time is your next uh, presentation? So if you're going to be if you're going to be around, actually later on, I'm on the 11th floor, uh, Glass Mountain, whatever the room is. The topic and the topic will be building how to build a security culture in your business. So that's the second uh, part of it, really, basically. See you later on there. Thank you. All right. Basically, follow up. All right. Uh, all the presentations uh, that are taking place today in all the venues are going to be available on demand. So. Um, when you go back to your to to your home country or to your work uh, organization, you can you can easily uh, watch all of them. But uh, we will um, we will continue the topic of uh, data loss, and um, Taron already uh, touched the topic of human factor, and it's going to be also a topic uh, our next topic. Uh, Anna Vladimirova Kryukova. Is going to talk about human factor in, da in data protection and how to minimize your risks. But we have some few, still a few minutes because of the uh, live uh, translation on the internet. We want to start on time. All right. So now you now you have time to just uh, prepare your uh, presentation. And again, we'll have about 25 minutes of presentation and uh, and some five minutes of question time. But if you want to grab some co coffee or something to eat, then you have some six minutes left. I'll remind you that we are in the venue four. We'll have Anna talking now, and then Alexey Leshnik is going to talk about data leak prevention technologies, a critical piece of the GDPR, uh, GDPR compliance puzzle. And then we'll have... Uh, Lunch break, one hour from one to two. And then we'll have three more speakers, coffee break, and two concluding speakers in the venue four. Anyways, you can see the program uh, on your smartphones or, or tablets.
just go to the DCCITSEC EU page and uh, you can see full agenda, all the speakers all the, in all the venues. And of course you have the program as well uh, printed out all over the place. tell you that uh, I have some few invitations for the after party and I've been instructed if you're being if you're gonna be um, if you're gonna put out questions to our speakers then you might get some invitations to after party that's if you need some push right but we have uh, three more minutes left and then we will move over ahead All right, just uh, we'll 
let's continue with uh, with the data loss topic and uh, what Tarun Santani, our first speaker, spoke about uh, the human factor and uh, a little bo a little bit more about the human factor in data protection and how to minimize your risks is going to talk uh, Anna Vladimirova Kryukova. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see you all here. So today I'm going to speak about humans and human beings in cybersecurity. I'm, a f I'm from a law office and we deal with human factor and with humans very often. So this is our, one of our main assets that we work with. Additionally, actually, I, uh, I'm a lecturer at uh, uh, at Riga Graduate School of Law, and I teach data protection course. So I also see students, humans, who deal with the new technologies, and it's quite interesting to see how they, uh, how they, uh, what do they think about that, and how their attitude changes depending on the topic that we cover during our, during our studies, dur during our lectures. So, as lawyers, we have clients, and it's very important for us to get our clients and to make them understand that actually cybersecurity and data protection are very important. However, if we speak really about, uh, um, about the perception of safety by humans, what can we say? Actually, very few of us can say that we know some safety issues. I mean, how, how many of you knows how are, how are we going to run away if fire starts here? Do you know where fire exits are? So basically don't care about your lives because not, not a lot of people were instructed by the employers how to save your lives in case of different accidents. So how can we manage to make their, our clients thinking about losing data and actually thinking they are employees about losing data, actually financial assets that are not even their financial assets, that are sometimes assets of their clients. And this is a very difficult thing to, to think about because we have to persuade persons to care about others' assets more than maybe about their lives, about their own interests. And if we study in if we analyze and examine the issue of human factor, we can find an answer to the question. So uh, during my today's, presenta today's presentation, I will look into human factor issues, human factor in cybersecurity, and some possibilities to get rid of human factor in cybersecurity, and some means. So what do we usually understand when we think about human factor? This is some kind of psychological things issue that influences the decision-making process. This is sometimes some physical stuff that also influences decision-making process. Because, I mean, people move, you can drop a cup of your coffee on your computer, and you're gonna have some problems with your data. This is also related to human factor. So any issues related to, uh, to us as human beings that have a combination of uh, mental and physical things. And usually, we, when we speak about human factor, we think about people who, take, who make decisions, who take these decisions. So the people, uh, the decisions of who, influence, influence the uh, result of a case. So the decision of this person, uh, the things and maybe the assets, the huge sums of money, <coughs> and sometimes life depends on uh, the decision of that person. Usually we think about such professions as uh, pilot or maybe industrial systems operator, and also actually data protection specialist or cybersecurity specialist who deals with uh, a lot of information and who takes, and who makes, who takes different very important decisions maybe every minute, and this person is vested with uh, quite a big amount of power to make these decisions. However, we often forget about other humans who are involved in this process. 
So basically, if we uh, analyze um, the definition of human factors, and why I'm speaking about human factors, because human factors is a science, and this is a science because uh, it, has, it, was, it has become a science, a center of an attention in uh, many areas of uh, related to safety, mainly aviation, industrial systems, and it's becoming popular in cybersecurity because maybe sometimes we are speaking about lives in cybersecurity, but mostly about assets and money, and this is only a very important thing to think about. So human factors, is a, an effort or a science which helps to generate and compile information about human capabilities and limitations with their relationship towards and relation and attitude towards equipment, systems, and other humans. So basically, if we use this definition, we can speak not only about those persons who make decisions, but also about any humans who are involved in the process in communication with systems, with other humans, within one environment, single environment. And if we are, if we are speaking about, for instance, in place, that can be an environment of, an, of one office. So this is a definition from FAA, it is Federal Aviation Agents of the US. And this definition is quite widely used by different associations and uh, communities uh, involved in human factor studies. So here we can see that not only cybersecurity specialists and security specialists are involved, but we also have users or employees, uh, simple, maybe if we speak about lawyers, simple lawyers, simple associates, staff that also deal with human data and actually in personal data and financial data that is a subject of the uh, cybersecurity of the protection enforcing uh, at uh, an organization. So what is the main purpose of applying human factors and human factors as a science? This is safety, this is making uh, the security and the personal data data as assets safer to make performance better, reliability and efficiency better. So if we continue speaking about human factors and to analyze this in order to understand what to start with, how to actually uh, make the situation better, how to develop this issue, how to deal with all these humans, users, uh, not only cybersecurity specialists, but also employees who are involved in data protection and data processing, actually. So we have three main elements on this system. So we have environment. We have life where actually these are humans. We have s hardware and software. And the main thing that uh, we should pay our attention today, taking into consideration the topic of my presentation is life where, and there is uh, there are three types of communication, of relation, of humans or lifeware. So humans deal with uh, hardware, software and other humans and we can analyze all of these three types of relationships and pay attention to them in order to understand where are the problem, how can we actually make the situation better with this problem. So there are two typical things main problems related to human factor. This is human error, which is responsible for 95% of security incidents, cybersecurity incidents, and decision-making process, which is also very important because humans use their own logics. They can be influenced by different mental things or uh, some other conditions influencing them. So in this case, uh, actually company or an employer can have serious, serious problems with uh, cybersecurity, actually serious financial problems. Of course, here you can, you can see an example of a huge loss. So it is related to the statistics and their information metrics related to actually a big, a big company uh, for an organization with 20, 100 million annual revenue, but at least uh, a loss that is related to the behavior of one employee 
can exceed 9 million for one company. And this is a huge amount of money. So imagine that you have to pay attention, more attention to human factor and to humans that deal with the data of your company because they are actually your human shield, if we can use this military terminology. And there is a study about what influences actually all this negative decision-making process and human errors things. And the first place is kept by inadequate, is actually lack of education, lack of training. This is what the previous presenter has been speaking about. There is also some issues related to conflicting roles, badly designed equipment, poor communication, and some really humorous things just like fatigue, distraction, and organizational factors. So here, we have all these three things that, are, that were mentioned in this environmental scheme uh, related to an environment. We have person who have software and hardware, and another, actually, a very important point is education. So what do we have to do? We have to educate our uh, human shield and to think about tailoring software and hardware to human factor because we cannot get rid of it completely. We cannot change human brain just like we can change uh, computer. There is uh, some silly quote that, uh, that is used that there is, if there is no person, there is no problem. However, we cannot do such things in cybersecurity and, uh, I mean, in any case, we can't do such things. So actually, we can educate this uh, life where, or we can educate our uh, human shield or in place. And this is an easiest way and the most effective way, uh, and it has been proved. However, if you want to introduce new tools, if you want to introduce new education, if you want to tailor your hardware or software somehow to human factor, you should get an acceptance from, uh, from a human because uh, you can introduce new measures. However, they're going to be effective only in this case, in the case where actually the subject of your uh, good intentions accepts your uh, new, uh, new, new things and new offers. So let's first talk about education. There are two important things that we need to mention about it here. This is the contents. Usually if we speak cybersecurity and data protection, there should be data protection, cybersecurity, and human factor education. The third very important point that we need to mention here. So we need to teach, uh, need to teach and uh, employees not only about data protection and cybersecurity things, but also about the importance of human factor. And these is our methods that are widely used and other factors that are related to human factors in education. For instance, just like aviation, industrial systems. You have to teach persons that human factor is also very important and how to deal with it, how to work in the team and how to work with uh, in some stressful situations. And of course, another important thing to make this education effective is the approach. You can have just simple lectures, seminars, you can have some practical uh, seminars, but it might turn out not to be effective. So you need to find an approach to make it targeted at a certain, uh, certain people. So, uh, if we speak about data protection and cybersecurity, uh, the contents of uh, new education can be different. I mean, data protection usually involves some legal stuff related to uh, regulation of data processing in the EU. It's uh, an upcoming uh, legal act as uh, GDPR that has already been mentioned. Cybersecurity can be related to some technical things and some are hot topics just like phishing because phishing is one of the most popular types how to uh, how to cause problems to employ to employers through their employees actually because people can trust really very easy and I think that the most part of you know what phishing is 
And another problem that you can teach during cybersecurity is malicious insiders, malicious codes, uh, unnecessary access, and other hot topics that are related to cybersecurity. And then can change very fast. So there is no single plan. However, this is, yes, this is a new point uh, that should be introduced into education. This is a human factor education. So there should be some things that we can say about human performance, limitations, communication, error, coaching, about actually talking with your employer or with a security specialist at your office about problems related to security, about uh, assessment, uh, about problems that you might have caused, actually, and you need to uh, address it and you need to deal with it very fast because time in this case really is money. You need to, uh, you, there is a need to address uh, and to explain in place or human shield how to deal with hazards, uh, maybe how to uh, also how to deal with and how carry out some peer-to-peer -peer assessment and coaching. And of course, individual approach to a specific team depends on how many employees are at the company, what are their positions, what are their skills, what do they need, have there been any negative experience. And another very important thing about approach is that you have to take into consideration the uh, actually the demand of uh, users and there is a whole study about that uh, actually, our office has carried this study of what users need uh, in order to use a digital service. And there are a bunch of factors that influence this choice, this choice and the effectiveness of uh, implementation of new measures. This can be financial reasons, awards, uh, your experience with the risks, trust, uh, social, uh, social reasons, authorities, time, emotions are very strong stimulus and if you use this approach and you can uh, then you're going to succeed with education so you don't need only uh, you need not only the information but you also need the correct approach and the result uh, and the result is going to be not only in uh, not only presented in financial uh, in financial uh, form just like uh, the increased return on investment, actually, but it's going to be an increase of uh, problems with the cybersecurity of in your organization. And as uh, I have started speaking about phishing, uh, so one of the examples that how in, uh, um, how education influences the number of clicks, and we can see that actually. Uh, it, 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 it has a dramatic influence uh, on reducing the amount of clicks executed by users. And of course, uh, another part is hardware and software, about things that we have to tailor this hardware and software to users. So mainly it means that we need to make this hardware and software usable. What does it mean to make it usable? So the user should be satisfied and there should uh, remember your software or hardware. They should make a free choice to use the certain service that you propose. And education, by the way, is also a service. So for this reason, you have also to use the correct approach in addressing the needs of employees in order to make this implement in the implementation of uh, and use in making use of human factor in order to make the implementation of measures uh, tailored and targeted at improving the cybersecurity situation in your company better. And of course, there is a, a speaking about return on investment. There are some financial consequences, in a good sense, that are in, uh, that an organization can experience after introducing correct education and. Uh, dealing correctly with human factor, I would say. And the statistics say that the risk is reduced uh, up to 70%. And this is quite a huge amount. Of course, it depends on uh, the, um, the size of your company, how much 
data, how much information, how much assets do you process, how much, uh, uh, to what extent the company is dependent uh, on processing of assets, of processing of data, how is it, to which extent it is important. So, uh, we're lawyers and we deal a bit, a little a bit with uh, cybersecurity and we also carry out such educational seminars to employees. And uh, if you have so many questions related to such educational things or to human factor, because we have been dealing with this lately uh, quite often, please, you're welcome. As I know we have some kind of four minutes left, so you're welcome to and ask your questions, you can get a free ticket to after a party. Yes. Uh, could you talk about uh, <coughs> if, you talk, if you talk about uh, these uh, terms and conditions uh, of the agreements written on the paper in very small text or in these license agreements of the software, and uh, the phenomena that uh, people do not really read this, is it more toward the human factor or it's uh, actually fault of the uh, system? Well, uh, it's actually, there are two things combined. It's this human factor that many service providers use because they know that uh, first humans and taking into consideration the speed of life, we don't like spend, uh, spending a lot of our time reading a lot of documents. So if we need a service, we want to use it as fast as we can. So we're going to click accept and that's all. So the first issue is time. Another issue that we're humans and we uh, have a distracted attention. So for instance, we can start reading these terms and conditions. We can go through two papers, three papers, but you, if you are not a lawyer, for instance, and you, if you are not used to work with a huge amount of papers and a huge amount of text, you're going to skip this information. You're going to maybe, you, te you will technically read the information, <coughs> sorry, but you will not get the essence of this information. I mean, many of us start reading some boring text and after five pages, you can find out that you have actually uh, read a lot, three or five pages, but you don't remember anything just because it's not interesting and because we can't concentrate on one thing for a very long time. So yes, this is a human factor that is actually used by uh, service providers. I cannot guarantee the uh, invitations to after party to everyone, but for the first question, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, thanks for the presentation. Um, I had a question about the um, human factor. If we can somehow relate it to the, f to, to the matter uh, of the fact that companies right now are becoming multinational and transnational, and if as employers we can somehow make decisions based on the pattern or behavioral pattern of a specific employee that somebody else from his uh, thing nation would, would do the same uh, in terms of, I don't know, uh, keeping the data or, or taking it out of the company. So what's your vision on this? Well, that's a very interesting question because first of all, if we deal with cybersecurity with the internet, there are no borders. So from another hand, actually we have borders and we have different nations and there are certain mentalities. And by the way, if we, sp if we speak about the study that I have been speaking about, about approach, yes. Uh, a lot of uh, factors that we can use to influence this approach and to influence uh, a human uh, and uh, the decision, decision-making process using human factor depends actually on, on the state. So if we speak about security, uh, we can clearly say that uh, third world countries uh, don't need security as much as uh, uh, more developed countries. And this is a, there is a clear statistics about that, so you can use it. And if you want to promote cybersecurity uh, in a more developed state or a state uh, with, uh, that cares about risks a lot, for instance, the US, you, you are not going to experience a lot of problems with that because there is a certain demand about that. However, if you want to promote a cybersecurity uh, and using human, human factor in uh, 
less developed states, you're going to have some problems because these people really have maybe a lot of danger. Uh, their life is under danger. They don't have any time. They don't have anything in mind to care about cybersecurity because they just don't need it. They, they have the most important things to care about. And in this case, you have to use a different approach. So yes, I think that uh, you should take into consideration the differences between mentalities. However, it can be complicated sometimes because you have mixed communities, because uh, sometimes if you deal with just online customers, for you it's going to be a bit, about a bit difficult to get the idea of what is the mentality, what is, what is the origin of this person. Thank you. Yeah, question in the back there. Um, actually, the, 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 uh, your conclusions and uh, comments regarding the multinational uh, characters is, is um, uh, very interesting, but, but uh, the more practical uh, are uh, the, the decisions are, 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 uh, uh, which may come from the uh, different human errors or, or uh, human factors in case uh, if there is, let's say, so, so remote empl employees, d d did you analyze also this factor, remote, uh, remote, uh, uh, let's say, uh, employees f who are working uh, uh, in in distance? Yes, yes, of course, but um, it really depends on the situation. So you have to take all these approach factors into into consideration have to take into consideration the fact where this person comes from, really, because he, this person can work on remote, but he can have a certain cu cultural basics. He, ha he can have a certain uh, national basis uh, or corporate culture. So you really need to study uh, an origin of a person. Where, where, is, uh, where his cultural and his attitude to work comes from. Okay, so uh, there is no single approach to uh, analyzing and to dealing with human factor related to remote wor workers because uh, they represent very different, different, uh, very different people from different locations, from different cultures. And this is, I guess, uh, one of the important things related to them that uh, this issue is becoming complicated due to also due to remote workers. And yes, uh, I, I, I tried to put my questions more precise. Yeah. Uh, the, the question is: Do the, the companies who did uh, who did some some decisions like to allow the, to their employees to work from their home mm -hmm. remotely? Do the, this, uh, these decisions have some impacts to increase of different human, human factors? Yes, uh, uh, remote, remote employees are considered, are considered less safe. First, because they don't deal a lot of with this corporate culture that, implain, that em employers create. And uh, uh, there are also some other factors involved, just like if you work from home, you are more relaxed, you are not so concentrated, for instance. And for this reason, this uh, makes uh, all this uh, uh, all the uh, uh, remote wo uh, workers in place less secure. For instance, uh, a remote worker would need to talk to a person through Skype or just using video. And usually a lot of persons have their passwords and username attached to their uh, refrigerators. And you can sit in front of the refrigerator and you can have a stick paper with your passwords and username and the person talking to you and seeing on your video, watching your video, can actually read all these username and passwords things. And is, this is not going to happen on your work, workplace usually. It doesn't happen in such a way. So yes, this is uh, an increased risk. Uh, remote workers are an increased risk. risk. All right. Unfortunately, we have to finish now. Uh, let's say thanks to Anna Vladimirova Kriukova. There's a small present and invitation to after party and also certificate. Thank you. So, um, yeah, and now is the time to move uh, if you want to. But our next presenter is going to be Alexey Lesnik. Uh, he's going to talk about data leak prevention technologies a critical piece of the GDPR compliance puzzle. 
Alexei is business development director of at Device Lock, with over 20 years of experience in the in, um, information security industry. Yeah. And again, uh, we'll have 25 minutes uh, for the presentation and then some five minutes for questions and then we'll have a lunch break. Please, the floor is all yours. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming here today. Can you listen to me? Can you hear me? Uh, if I will start uh, speaking not loudly enough, please let me know because this is my negative, you know, feature. Uh, my name is Alexey Lesnik. I work for Device Lock, a company that develops the like-named endpoint data leakage prevention software. Uh, and uh, recently, specifically, since May, June this year, quite a lot of our customers and prospects have asked us the same question. Could data leak prevention technologies be useful in achieving compliance with the newly adopted in the European Union uh, general data protection regulation? Mm. And uh, this presentation provides a brief explanatory answer to this question based on uh, the analysis we conducted on the uh, regulations text uh, uh, by mapping uh, uh, its uh, legal requirements down to technical requirements and then comparing uh, them with the functional capabilities of uh, data leak prevention and other IT security technologies available today. The arguments and conclusions from uh, this uh, presentation can be used by system and security architects chief information security officers and other decision makers for developing their own conclusive opinion whether DLP components should be used in uh, the projects aimed at making the corporate IT systems GDPR compliant. Uh, first of all, let's recall why GDPR has become so hot topic. The main the reason uh, is that this regulation significantly changes the landscape and level of legal risks for those companies that handle personal data in their business processes. The GDPR supersedes the old data protection directive and for what is important for private persons, mm, this regulation unifies the legal norms and enforcement procedures related to personal data protection across the entire European Union because the GDPR is a law, a set of strictly specified and uh, directly enforceable rules rather than just a set of goals as is the old directive. On the other hand, for organizations, uh, the regulation uh, brings uh, several complications. Uh, their analysis is not likely the uh, goal of this presentation, so that would be uh, enough to mention just a very few of them. Um, I would say the most indicative. One of these important changes is uh, that first time ever, the principle of data protection by design has become a law norm in a European law. Uh, which, uh, and for the majority of organizations, for the absolute majority of, the organ of organizations, uh, compliance with this principle will require a strategic shift in the system's design and development with potential, potentially um, considerable implications or considerable um, impacts uh, in terms of development costs uh, and design costs. 
However, the most important uh, for organizations are uh, very high penalties uh, for infringing the regulation. This may reach up to 20 million euro or up to 4% uh, percent of the total worldwide turnover, not income, an, uh, annual turnover, uh, whichever, whichever is higher. A very compelling motivation to comply with the regulation. Uh, besides, the regulation uh, specifies very all a very short uh, data breach notification time, just 72 hours, and exceeding this limit may lead to uh, the just mentioned uh, large penalties. Taking into account these and other innovations introduced in the regulation, it shouldn't be a surprise at all that uh, European organizations are very much interested in understanding the obligations under uh, this new law and developing ways how to comply with this regulation. Before we go uh, to legal requirements, let's, uh, let's uh, refresh our memory on what are data leak prevention technologies and they're uh, defining uh, functions and features because it will be useful further uh, later on uh, for understanding the logic of conclusions. Uh, data leak prevention technologies is a system of integrated IT security uh, technologies that detect and prevent uh, unauthorized use, transmission, and uh, storage of confidential, protected, or otherwise sensitive data by applying a combination of contextual and content uh, analysis methods and enforcing centrally managed data protection policies. Every word in this uh, definition is very important, but I will not spend your time on you know, dedicating, uh, dedicative, uh, dedicated explanation. Um, uh, in order to protect uh, digital data in the three fundamental state, states, mm. data DLP systems uh, implement uh, three DLP functional types, uh, including data in use DLP, data in motion DLP, and data at rest DLP. Data in use DLP uh, controls uh, access and transfer operations. Uh, uh, on local endpoint computers. Uh, data in motion DLP prevents leakage, uh, data leakage through, uh, uh, through network communications. And uh, data at rest discovers exposed uh, confidential content in data stored at corporate IT assets and can automatically initiate various remediation actions to prevent unauthorized access uh, use and transmission of this data. Each DLP functional type uses uh, different uh, specific endpoint enforcement agents. Only endpoint agents can be used to enforce data in use DLP, while uh, both uh, endpoint agents and uh, network resident hardware, software, or virtual appliances uh, can complement each other to enforce data in motion DLP. Data at rest DLP uses endpoint agents to scan local file systems, and uh, network resident uh, discovery service can be used for remote scanning. What are defining DLP features and functions? First, this is the ability to enforce real-time preventive controls, meaning something before something bad happens, over a wide range of uh, data leakage channels and scenarios, including practically all uh, local uh, channels on endpoint computers, most risky network communications, and uh, various uh, data storage devices and systems. Second, a comprehensive set of 
contextual parameters can be used for operation analysis and controls. Here you can, you can see just a few of them listed, but in reality, dozens of such parameters can be used in DLP policies. Third, and the most important, is the ability to info, analyze and classify the informational, human meaningful content of transmitted, used, and stored data of various formats and types, including not only uh, files and emails, but also uh, instant messages, web forms, web mails, te raw textual data, and in some scenarios, even binaries. In DLP, content analysis is used to detect um, prohibited content in data and uh, block unauthorized operations with this data. And the last defining DLP attribute is that all data protection policies, in this case DLP policies, are managed centrally by IT security administrators rather than by end users, for example, document owners. This is the biggest difference, by the way, and also content analysis with the very popular IRM, Information Rights Management Technology. Uh, important is that in DLP systems, uh, these uh, defining functions and features are deeply integrated on both management and execution levels. And it is this deep integration that differentiates data leakage prevention from other IT security technologies and enables DLP to deliver its unique value when it comes to protecting corporate IT systems against data leaks. In other words, no real substitutes are for DLP. No other IT security technology available today has the same integrated set of functions and features dedicated and uh, optimized for the mission of data leak prevention. That's about refre refresh refreshment about DLP. Now I can share with you the results of our research of the regulations text. Uh, expectedly, DLP is not mentioned in the document. There are only two types of specific security technologies pres prescribed by the regulation, including uh, encryption and pseudonymization, uh, which is uh, fully reasonable. Uh, strange though is that although the personal data breach definition is in the document's glossary, and uh, uh, the regulation specifies the data breach notification time, as well as uh, penalties for uh, delaying with notifications. We could not find any direct wording that tells uh, personal data breaches shall be uh, prevented. Uh, indeed, that was not what we wanted, and we um, patiently uh, studied uh, logical relations between different articles in this legal text. And uh, the result of this study was very positive. Uh, one of the fundamental data protection principles specified in Article 5 uh, or, uh, of the regulation requires security uh, for personal data to be uh, uh, to include uh, also protection against unauthorized or unlawful processing and um, against accident accidental loss, destruction, and uh, damage. What does the term processing mean can be found in uh, the glossary of the document, uh, which you can see now. Processing denotes several types of uh, processing operations. 
uh, including among others, uh, the operations that we are interested in, storage use, disclosure by transmission, dissemination, or otherwise making available. If we, uh, if we substitute the word processing in the articulation of the integrity and confidentiality principle by the list of operations, we, uh, specific operations uh, we are interested in, we derive a subordinate requirement that relates specifically to these operations. And you can see the definition of this requirement uh, now appears on the screen. If we compare this derived requirement with the personal data breach definition uh, in the documents glossary, Article 4, we can see that this personal data breach definition is exactly the same as the highlighted part of the derived principle. Then, if, we, if, the, if the words uh, personal data breach are used instead of the highlighted text in the requirement, this, re this derived requirement transforms into the one that we have been looking for, the one that was hidden uh, under the hood of cryptic legal language. Uh, and it sounds like personal data shall be protected against data breaches. And the last, uh, the last step in the logic of uh, our textual analysis is to compare uh, the classic definition of data leak, which, came from, which comes from the industry, with the personal data breach definition from the uh, regulations glossary. Uh, 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 the, comparison, the comparison reveals that actually data leak is a type of data breach, as you can see, and uh, uh, as, uh, which means that as personal data shall be protected against data breaches, they shall be protected against any type of data breaches, including data leaks. Bingo. Uh, so not direct, uh, so without any direct wording, uh, the GDPR logically whoops. GDPR, the GDPR uh, logically requires that personal data shall be protected against data leaks. Uh, now let's get to, from the legal findings to the technical level. What is technically necessary to protect data of specific type that the regulation is about? The nature of the G GDPR is the protection of a specific type of data, personal data, the data that contain personally identifiable information. But uh, getting back to reality, uh, we must say that in any IT systems processing personal data, a lot of other types of data is also used, including um, various auxiliary business process information, um, uh, employees communications, reports, um, anonymized uh, statistics, etc., etc. Uh, this these uh, types of data, they do not contain personal information and uh, their processing does not require GDPR compliance. In other words, uh, operations with non-personal data uh, shall neither be protected by GDPR enforcement components nor restricted by them. As a result, in many scenarios, the very same operation, for example, sending email, uh, shall either be allowed because it carries on non-personal data and uh, uh, does not violate any GDPR requirement, or this operation with personal data shall be uh, blocked because it leads to a data leak. However, the 
only difference between these two cases is the, is the content of the processed data. This means that security components of GDPR compliant processing systems must use content analysis in order to uh, transparently allow non-personal data operations and at the same time uh, for blocking uh, operations with personal data in order to prevent data leaks. This is very important um, point before we can go to the summary uh, uh, with, to the summary of uh, the results of our research um, on the main topic of this presentation. Uh, let's, uh, let's recall what we have. Personal data shall be protected against data breaches, which means that personal data shall be protected against data leaks. And in order to protect against data leaks, uh, security components must use content analysis uh, uh, to detect and control operations with personal data. And as we remember from, uh, from the beginning of this presentation, um, data leak prevention is the only existing technology that can do can then can use content analysis for of uh, transmitted used and stored data in order to enforce real time security controls. So, uh, what we can say we can say that DLP is critical for GDPR compliance. That does not mean in no way this means that uh, other technologies are not required. Besides those directly recommended, recommended in, uh, in the regulation, uh, many other technologies uh, are required to comply with GDPR because there are many principles uh, in addition to the integrity and confidentiality principle. So, but the most important uh, outcome uh, and conclusion for us as, D as DLP vendor and for our customers is that D data leak prevention is a necessary uh, it's a necessary piece of this uh, entire uh, technological puzzle needed for GDPR compliance. Uh, and uh, now, uh, 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 if we have time, uh, yeah, I'll try to uh, to do this best uh, to to do my best to speed up. Uh, um, pragmatic question: Which types, uh, which DLP types to use? If you get back to the derived requirement and look at, uh, at the types of, of protections required, that we can see that all three DLP functional types are required because storage, use, and disclosure, but transmission and also dissemination uh, are mentioned in the requirement. And uh, the next uh, question uh, we often hear now is what data protection by design? Uh, to to, to describe this in, in, in a couple of words. Uh, data protection in this case and security in, in general requirements and functionality must be considered as a, as a core business requirements when you develop any application or system. And uh, in, practice, in practice it means that developers must uh, also have uh, security expertise and the system is not ready for release uh, until all data protection features are also developed and QA tested at the same level of reliability that core business operations. Uh, and if we apply this to DLP as a core security feature of GDPR compliance, uh, then um, what should be taken into consideration? Important is that, um, you know, um, besides business logic, which may be done, which may be implemented as a set of custom applications, yeah? Uh, there are uh, many general purpose components used in modern uh, systems and solutions, including databases, uh, standard web browsers, email system, instant messaging, and other things, yeah? And uh, also, 
uh, network and operating systems are involved. And another component of any business system that processes personal data is user. Users and administrators. And uh, what is important to know when you know, doing DLP by design that every IT component might have, uh, might require different DLP mechanisms uh, for data leak prevention. Uh, and more, uh, it even more, you know, important is that uh, human nature uh, is uh, unchangeable. We all times will be doing accidental mistakes. We will be negligible. In some cases, we will misconduct, or we we will become uh, victims of social engineering, phishing, and all the things leads lead to data leaks. So, uh, the the um, the human a hey, sorry my English pro probably not uh, perfect, but humans must be uh, considered as an integral part of any uh, data processing system, and for them special care should, shall be taken uh, in the DLP policies. Uh, and when, cons when uh, choosing DLP solutions, of course, all these uh, criteria must be taken into, in cons into consideration. And in case if uh, just a single DLP solution uh, cannot cover all these concerns, then uh, uh, other complementary DLP sh solutions uh, shall be used. F f the very real example that many storage, uh, cloud storage uh, providers, service providers, they actually integrate, uh, they embedded uh, DLP components with APIs, and uh, this can be used for uh, integration with other DLP solutions or using separately. So that's basically all uh, the content, and uh, let's uh, get a information on conclusion on conclusions gdpr does not uh, directly mention but logically requires the use of dlp technologies uh, specifically implementation of the integrity and confidentiality principle uh, is practically impossible without using dlp solutions as a core security feature of gdpr compliant data processing dlp should be in, included in the implementation of data protection by design, whichever form it takes. And uh, another, um, uh, another uh, conclusion, uh, another part of the G GDPR nature is that uh, protects against internal threats, processing related and human related. Uh, and uh, the consequence is that most effective for GDPR compliance will be those DLP solutions that are focused on preventing insider data leaks. This is exactly uh, what device log DLP does. Who are insiders? Insiders are normal business users. They create, they use, and they store information. For, in order to do that job, they use mostly personal computers laptops, desktops, uh, servers, and recently tablets, and BYOD devices. Uh, if uh, organization, and if an organization uh, do, uh, cannot control, does not control uh, access to uh, information on endpoint computers, and uh, it's uh, transfer from this uh, endpoint computer, uh, then a lot of, uh, easy ways remains to be completely open uh, for accidental or deliberate extrusion of valuable corporate data to the wild. Uh, in order to solve this problem, Device Lock has developed a software solution that uh, includes uh, for preventing data leaks on endpoint computers. The solution includes uh, uh, a lightweight endpoint agent that runs on every protected endpoint computer. And uh, uh, it protects uh, this computer against all three types of uh, data leaks. Data in use, data in motion, and data at rest. 
Uh, this is a very lightweight enforcement agent for Windows and Mac computers. And um, uh, another important thing is that this solution is very scalable and easy to use because uh, one of the options of management platforms and consoles is a custom-made MMC snap-in to the uh, Microsoft uh, Group Policy Management Console. So it means that in order to manage this solution, uh, you do not need uh, a, something new, new platform. You can use your Active Directory controller to do this with very familiar graphical user interface because everything is managed natively via group policies. It's not just graphical user interface. It's native management. And of course, no involvement of end users and uh, the agent is protected uh, um, also even from local system administrators. Yeah, um, there's just a couple of words about the company. We are already 20 years on the market. Initially, we develop endpoint device port control software and get, uh, you know, probably we still are the biggest provider of device port control software. And since 2011, we sell also our data leak, total data leak prevention uh, software. A lot of customers throughout the world, privately owned. Um, research and development in R Moscow, Russia. That's probably important for you now. Although our biggest market is the United States. And um, we sell in almost uh, more than 100 countries. And uh, in order to estimate the quality of our product, you can go and read, for example, SC Magazine, which gave us five-star rating in, uh, the, in the four uh, consecutive uh, evaluations uh, that they made uh, annually. Uh, and you can see, uh, you know, this selling, you know, uh, characteristics. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm ready for any questions right now and afterwards. Thank you. Okay, any questions? We're out of time. There are no questions. Let's say thank you to Alex Lesnik. And um, you have a stand right there if, if somebody wants to uh, yeah. come to you and talk to you. Thank you so much. Uh, now we have one hour lunch break uh, and uh, we'll see you back at two o'clock. Thank you.
Well, welcome back to the uh, venue four of the DSS IT Sec 2016. Hopefully, you had you had a chance to uh, grab some lunch, uh, despite the long line there. Um, but uh, we will continue where we left left off at uh, the first part. We we're talking about the information leaks, and now uh, it's time for Ian Wallace to speak from Digital Guardian about prevention of uh, insider leaks, and he'll talk also uh, about some exact cases. But now it's uh, the floor is all yours. Please welcome Ian Wallace. Hi. <laughs> so, who was in the previous presentation? Can I just ask you to show your hands? The one before lunch? Anybody? No, only one, okay. You missed, you missed something. Um, it was about GDPR, the new laws, and a kind of a logical proof that as part of meeting those requirements, you had to implement a DLP solution. That's not something that people really enjoy doing. Um, my name is Ian Wallace. I've been with Digital Guardian for five years. We're a DLP, traditional DLP vendor. We think of it now more as an advanced threat protection platform rather than just DLP, but DLP is certainly part of what we're doing. And I'm going to focus on that DLP because it's relevant to the theme that we've got going here. Um, DLP has a reputation. <laughs> Five years ago, nobody wanted to say DLP. You'd say, oh, we do something different, but not DLP. And if you said DLP to people, they'd lose interest very quickly. With what's happened in the last couple of years, the major breaches that we read about every day in the newspaper, it's become a commonly accepted term. Everybody's claiming to do DLP. At the ITSA event in Germany last week, um, lots of vendors using DLP and breaking the kill chain. We're all saying the same things and it's very difficult to differentiate between those. I don't want to talk so much about the product, but I want to talk about how you can actually do this successfully. Alexei, in his previous presentation, proved logically that we all have to implement some sort of DLP if we process any sort of personal information. Um, there's other information that is not covered by that set of laws that a lot of companies want to protect, intellectual property, designs, CAD drawings. Um, it's not always financial or personal, but the principles are the same. And the focus really is on not just how to do it, but how to do it successfully. So I'm going to start off with a little, very brief introduction to the company. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you may not have heard of Digital Guardian. It's not a, a household name, although in the particular sector of DLP, it's uh, one of the leading players. Just refresh on what we mean by data loss prevention, and then look at how you can actually implement this successfully, and the strategy that I've seen customers implement. Before I was a pre-sales engineer, I was actually a professional services person, so I've actually deployed this product at scale with real customers. Um, so it's not really marketing-based, it's more my own experience. Digital Guardian's been around for quite a long time. I mean, 2003 is a long time ago in computer terms. Um, it started off with a small startup company in the States who were not doing DLP, were doing more pharmaceutical development, had some of their intellectual property stolen, looked at the market, found there was no solution that would have prevented that from happening, and being a startup, decided to start up again, this time preventing what had just happened to them because they'd realized there was a market for it. And since then, we've been focused purely on data loss prevention of intellectual property based on the that real example that the founders had of losing their own data. Based in Boston, offices all over the place, Gartner Raiders as the, one of the leaders in um, this space. One of the things that maybe is different about the product, I mean, there's lots of stuff that's different, but one of the things that um, immediately springs out is that we're platform agnostic, so it works Linux, Macintosh, and Windows, um, which I don't think any other solution does. We're network and endpoint based, um, so we have two different parts of a solution. And we protect against not just insider threat, but external threat, which sounds like a strange claim to make, um, but it's true, and technically I can explain to you why that is. Um, and we offer data protection, advanced threat protection, and a host of other things. But it's not so much about the product, it's about how you approach this sort of task. Some scary numbers to start with. 
55% of all attacks were carried out by somebody with inside access. So an employee typically, although it might be compromised credentials. That also means that 45% of attacks were carried out by people outside the company. So I always find it interesting when I'm talking to somebody and they say, oh, we want to prevent insider threat, data loss. I say, well, do you want to prevent some risks or all risks? And of course, the only answer you can give to that is all risks. So it has to be both insider and external. And if you can do that with one agent and one product, then that's great. 59% of employees who quit take some company data with them. Ask yourselves this. If you were going to leave your company tomorrow, what would you take? It's an interesting question, right? A lot of people, when they think about it, would take their PST file, all their mails, just to think what's in there. If you just had one thing that you could take, that would be really useful. Sales guys typically would go into Salesforce and run off some report listing all potential customer contacts and you know, as much contact information as possible. But everybody does it. What we also see, more so in the States, I think, kind of an interesting behavior called squirreling, where one person in a department is let go, as they say, sacked, dismissed, fired. And his neighbors in the adjacent cubicles start to collect data. They don't actually steal it, but we see this behavior, people collecting a little folder of stuff that they would take with them. That's kind of an interesting behavior to see. So people preparing to steal data rather than actually stealing it, we see. Because the way it's going to work in the States, hopefully it's different here, is your boss says to you, Ian, can you come into my office? Oh, and bring your laptop and your badge. You've then got like about 30 seconds to copy stuff to USB. <laughs> and that's what this folder on your desktop is for. It's your, your escape package. So 59% of people take something with them deliberately. Um, that's pretty high. And the low number is that only 18% of companies are really thinking about this stuff. I mean, actually 20% could be worse, um, but it's about 20%. Why? Because they don't know how or they're afraid to try. Um, as a person responsible for implementing this sort of solution, um, I've got two concerns. One is I have to prevent data loss. Secondly, I have to prevent career loss. And implementing a DLP project badly can be severely career limiting. Um, you can break the business, and we want to see how to avoid that. We talk about inadvertent data loss, malicious insiders. Malicious insiders always sounds really exciting, um, you know, people stealing your data. Actually, it's not that exciting in the real world. A lot of what we see is almost the opposite. It's people inadvertently exposing sensitive data to risk, but not meaning to. So I'm an employee, I'm actually a good employee. Um, I told my boss it would be finished Monday. Yeah, I was on eBay a bit, and then I didn't really finish it. So I'm going to copy it onto a USB stick, take it home, work on it at the weekend, bring it back Monday. I'm a great employee. I'm putting in extra time. Unfortunately, I lost the USB stick, so that sucks. Or, um, no, I'm an admin person. Every Friday, I have to send this Excel spreadsheet to our suppliers, and it's like 5.30, and I kind of like to get out of here. And I send the email, and it comes back, exceeds your mailbox size. Right, do I open an IT ticket at 5.30 on a Friday, the sun's shining, I want to go and get a beer somewhere? No, I know how to share data. I'll put it in Dropbox, send a link, brilliant idea. I think I should get like employee of the month for that one and a 50 euro Amazon voucher. Actually, I get called up by the security people saying, why did you do that? I didn't realize what I was doing. I thought I was doing the right thing. We see a lot of that sort of behavior. So it's not always as exciting as malicious, although that does play a part. And of course, there is deliberate theft. I mean, here, the guy on the left for you, you know, stealing the laptop. I've experienced this as well. Um, a chemical company I worked for, their chief development scientists were repeatedly having their laptop stolen. And it turned out what was happening was children, well, teenagers, well, OK, 14-year-olds, were being paid to follow these people for weeks at a time until they made a mistake. Like this guy left his car window open at a gas station, went to buy some cigarettes, came out, laptops gone. They would follow these people for weeks until they just made one little mistake and they could take the laptop. And if they got caught, they were 14 in Germany. They send them back home. They can't do anything. So they only needed a one-way ticket to come. Um, that, that's a real risk as well, but very, very targeted. And we talk about disgruntled employees. I mean, I've been in companies where 
Everybody was disgruntled. Not now, but in the past. But people taking stuff with them. Also people stealing stuff for commercial gain, stealing stuff to punish their company, to punish their boss. Um, those, those are common scenarios. I mean, I'm not, I don't think they're so common, but it's a, it is a real risk. And there's also the external attackers, people who are deliberately targeting your company with something that antivirus is not going to help you with. I mean, if I want to target a particular company, I'm going to do my homework. It'll take me a couple of weeks. I won't do it alone. I'll map out the people, the companies. I'll go to pubs. I'll spill beer on people. I'll get into conversations with them. I'll say my phone's broken. They'll tell me who their network guy is. Hey, go speak to him. And you know, after a couple of weeks in this pub hanging out with them, I know them. I know who's interested in Formula One cars. I send them a PDF because my wife works in the, the marketing department at Formula One. I say, like, oh, sorry about the beer. Here's a ticket. He opens a PDF. I'm in. It's a lot of work, but all of us would be susceptible to it. I think all of us would be susceptible to a phishing attack, although we're probably all IT security people. Eventually, you'll get one that just looks so real, you'll open it just by chance. So preventing the attack is impossible, but preventing data loss resulting from it is possible. We're talking about all this sort of data data. Whatever it is your important data is, it's, it's data that's sensitive. So how do we do this in the real world? Um, we don't want to just block everything. Sometimes people say, oh, OK, make it all stop. OK, <laughs> make what stop? Well, I don't know, just make it all stop, the data loss stuff. You're a data loss prevention company. Prevent my data from getting lost. Well, OK, nice idea, not going to work. We need to educate users to stop doing risky behaviors. Um, we need to obviously do what's technically possible. So how would it actually work in the real world? Well, obviously, there's some basics. You have to have some acceptable use policy, some security policy. I can't do that for you. No vendor will. OK, consulting firms will. Um, be clear that people understand what's in that policy. Make sure it's communicated. Make sure people actually do understand what it means. But even so, I read some policy when I joined the company. Do I remember it six months later? Probably not. Does it really apply to me every day? Not really. But you have to start from there. I won't implement policies in a tool where there's no actual company policy against it. Why would you want to stop people doing that? You, you don't tell them they can't, so why stop them? But this has to be the starting point. And if you have this, that's a good place to start. I can take this policy, which is a piece of paper, and give you a tool which will help you to implement and monitor that policy, which actually makes it an effective business process. A policy without a tool to enforce it is just a policy. You can ignore it. It's like a nice to have. We want to make sure that people understand what is and isn't acceptable. Doing a DLP project as part of a larger data security project is a really good idea. There's lots of interesting stuff out there on the market. Educational videos, education programs, companies that'll do phishing testing for you, actually send your employees phishing emails to educate them. Um, if you can do it as part of a larger plan so that people understand what they should be doing and then help them to do it correctly, um, that's a really good idea. Doing it's not an IT department project that takes two weeks. It's part of a larger IT awareness project, if it's done properly. It doesn't have to be, but it, it works better that way. Think about what happens when somebody leaves the company or you think somebody's likely to be upset. Maybe they didn't get a promotion and maybe they got a grudge. To monitor those people maybe differently. Um, General Electric, one of our biggest customers, actually has a specific report that when somebody leaves, they have what's called an exit interview. The employee comes into the office with personnel and their manager, and they talk about the goods and the bads. And at the end of it, they say, you know, you understand the acceptable use policy, that you won't take any data with you. And then they turn a little document over to them and say, and this is a list of all the sensitive data that you've handled in the last six months. Just make sure that none of it actually goes public, because if it does, we know who had it last. It was you. And just doing that, even if it's not really enforceable, has a big impact, they think. It actually makes people think twice or three times about what they're about to do, or maybe were thinking of doing. No, you sort of felt like, I'll get, it, I'll get you, and then you realize actually the legal implications of doing it, and it just brings you back down to earth. We need tools that will help us implement this. We need comprehensive data classification policies, automatic 
based on content, based on context, based on the user's input, that's obvious. Um, we need some way of actually implementing this policy at the end point. It's at the end point that data loss occurs. It's not from the servers. It's from your laptop, your desktop systems, your bring your own disaster systems if you have them, although that's a little bit more tricky. Um, and we need some way of monitoring the data, not just to monitor people, but to monitor the effectiveness of what we're doing. Now, are we actually going the right way? Are we making things better? Are we securing our data? We spent money. Was it money well spent? So you need all of that. So how do we do it in real world? OK, management buy-in, everybody says that. It is important. Um, I've been in a case where a top currency dealer was stealing data. We detected it. We told his manager. His manager told his manager. And he said, I don't care. He's my best employee. He earns us millions a day. He can do what he likes. So, well, that's not really management buy-in. That doesn't really help you implement something. Technology is not just a solution. And a DLP product is not the policy. The policy has to come first. People or customers often ask me, what do other customers do? What policy should I have? I can't answer that. That has to come from the business. It's also a mistake to think that you're buying a product and maybe some professional services and it's five days. It's not. It's a tool that's going to take you on a journey that's going to last more than five days. Although it may start off with five days of professional services or 10 days or 20 days, but it's not the end of the journey. You're not saying, oh yeah, we'll have done DLP by the 25th of November, tick. It's not that sort of project. You'll see why. Start with visibility. Don't change anything. Get visibility into what's going on in the company. See how your data is flowing. Print out a report or analyze it in the console. Pick three things. Pick the three things that scare you the most as the person responsible for that. You, you'll see a thousand things. Just pick the three things that worry you most. OK, so we see senior management PST files on a USB stick. That's bad. We see CAD drawings going to Dropbox. Oh, that's bad. We see unencrypted credit card numbers in emails. That's bad. Pick those three and start to correct them. Resist the temptation to do everything on day one. Produce a prompt that tells people, well, in this case, it's a terrible prompt. It tells them nothing. This action is being recorded. What did I do? I'll show you a better example in the next slide. But you can start off by prompting people with an option to continue. So I'm doing something. I'm warned. I can choose to do it or not do it. This is a bad prompt. A prompt should tell people what they just did, how to do it correctly, how to get help doing that, and who to contact if they're not sure. So don't copy stuff to unencrypted USB sticks. Get an encrypted USB stick. Don't copy stuff to Dropbox. Use our share file system. Here's a URL for it. Here's the person responsible for it. So you're telling them what they've done and what they should be doing and how to get help doing that. That's very powerful. It reinforces stuff that should be in the policy. If it wasn't in the policy, you shouldn't be doing this. This is a better prompt. It tells them exactly that sort of stuff. So I'm telling people for four weeks, it's a bad idea how to do it correctly. At the end of four weeks, I change it over, and I ask them, why are you doing it? I say, we said don't do it for four weeks. You're doing it. Why? Maybe there's some business process that I haven't understood. And if I break it, I won't be successful. Somebody's still copying stuff to USB because they're working in an engineering department. They have some Siemens simulation software. They write programs. They copy it to USB sticks. They take the USB sticks into the factory. They put the USB sticks in the machine tools, and they reprogram the machine tools. If I block that, I would have broken that part of the business. I've seen that. And after another four weeks, <coughs> now I'm going to block. I'm going to block the behavior and say, sorry, you can't do that. I warned you. I asked you why you were doing it, no response. Now you can't do it. If I do break something, it's not my fault. Are we there yet? No. I fix three things, but I've still got visibility to what's happening. I go back, I pick another three things. I do the same again. It's a process. Over time, the business changes, the tools we use change, the user's behavior change. But I've got a tool that gives me visibility at the kernel level into what's happening. I can just keep going back and fixing this and adapting it. Making, helping people do the right thing is a much more positive job than blocking stuff all the time. Um, you can actually feel good about yourself doing this as well, because it will keep changing. Um, 
it's not a five-day thing. But you've got a tool and you, you've got a policy, you just keep going. It takes time, but you can stop data getting lost. You can, and what I've just said about users, that was like, what, 54%, right? And the other 45% we can do as well because of the way our technology works. Somebody coming in externally, planting malware, again, that's just stuff that we see at the kernel level and inside the applications. We've got patterns that match that type of behavior, not the actual malware, obviously, because it w won't have a pattern. But it's just stuff happening that we see and we have a policy that we can use to block. So the 55% of users is what we traditionally think about. The 45% you don't generally associate with a DLP product, but we're what we call an a threat-aware data protection platform. It, it's a term that's kind of not current, so I'm not using it. People know what DLP is, so I prefer to use that. Um, but DLP from external threat, for us, based on an agent, based on the Windows, Linux, or Mac kernel, is, it's the same problem. It's just different policies. It's, it's, it, the, the principle is the same. And with a network device, I can reduce my risk by 80% probably. With standard DLP policies, I can get another 15%. The 5% that's left are all the interesting what-if cases. Don't let those extreme what-if cases put you off at least trying to do the other 95%. Ah, but what if somebody... Um, writes their own archiving tool, uses a remote session to this machine, and then jumps to this machine, um, gets the data into Toad, does a screenshot of it on the screen, pastes it into Word, zips that, renames it, and sends it out. Can you block that? So, well, probably, but let's not worry about that until we've got a day where you go into your console and there's nothing interesting in there. Then we'll talk about all the interesting what-ifs because otherwise you'll never start. You'll just keep up with like, what ifs? So, the previous presenter proved to you that you have to implement DLP, and I made it sound really easy. <laughs> it's not trivial, but people do do this every day. Companies do implement DLP policies every day. Don't be afraid to try, and legally, you have to anyway. So. Hopefully, you feel less afraid about tackling it um, than you did before. Thank you for your time. Um, are there any questions? I think I've got a few minutes left. Please. Yeah. Uh, just a comment, it's not a question. Uh, you cannot block everything, right? And uh, anyway, the employees, they will find a way to steal this information. From our experience, if they feel that somebody is taking a look after them all the time, mm. and you allow them to do everything, but they know that somebody is just checking it. It, it works much better. Okay. And uh, one more thing is uh, that um, it's, it's about a culture of the employees of the company. Yeah. What do they feel about the company? Do they care about the company? Mm. And, it, and this, is, this comes more from the bosses. Uh, what is their attitude to mm. employees? Uh, do they take care of the employees? And, yeah, yeah. So this is it. Uh, one more thing. I didn't see anything about the uh, administrators. These are the biggest threat because you cannot control them. Oh, right? They will do everything, whatever it is, and uh, the, uh, um, uh, the boss should just trust him. I always get this question. No. Yes, but this administrator, he got uh, access to everything, right? Yes, it is. Mm. He got access, but if you don't trust him, just, just fire him. I mean... That, that's a valid point. Administrators for us are just other users. I mean, they can't uninstall the software. They can't see it any more than anybody else can. And they, they have more trust. And sometimes they're the first people who are actually um, suspected. We've got specific cases which are just about proving that an administrator did or often did not do that. Um, I've got a customer who's an outsourcing company. And their whole use case is because they administer somebody else's systems and to be able to prove to their clients that their administrators didn't do something. Yeah, just so, had so to prove my, 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 my boss that uh, what did they steal over data? So they don't. Yeah. Well, how, how do you know that? They have the access to everything. Yeah, I mean, it's okay to prove they that somebody didn't. They can if they want. I would argue with that, but yeah, okay, I mean, yeah, well, we're, we're talking percentages. Point, we can do a lot. The main point is that uh, you should monitor them and you should tell them that everything is being um, monitored, okay. logged, 
they accept it mm. if you show them. This is a cultural difference, I think. Um, yeah, it's a valid point. You could do it that way. You just skip the prompts. <laughs> You can so do. Your decision, you can copy something or not. Yeah. You you can do it that way. The technology is the same. We could we could do it that way. Well, but yeah, interesting. Well, in in your experience, what was what has been the most effective way dealing with the administrators? Uh, we wouldn't treat them any differently to a user. Um, they've got more rights, but um, they, they, they 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 can't bypass the software. Mm -hmm. um, unless they are the digital guardian administrator, who I guess you have to trust. That's probably the one person that you need to trust. Why? Although, although I've, seen, I've seen situations where nobody has been given admin rights, and it's a split password, so two people have to sign on um, to actually get admin rights. Like starting a nuclear bomb? Sorry? Like starting a nuclear bomb. You need two people, right? I think you need three. Three? Okay. Well, it'll be one in a couple of weeks. <laughs> All right. A any more questions? Um, um, uh, what you say is uh, this is out of scope of the DLP actually so there is a, another solutions for administrators for example a privilege at user monitoring so we can record everything what they're doing uh, with RDP remote desktop session or SSH it's no problem I can see what uh, what uh, doing the administrators <laughs> okay well yeah, okay. Oops. All right. That was definitely the time That's out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's check our phones. Uh, has the data been leaked or, or not yet? When I came here, I, I uh, deleted all my sensitive uh, pictures from my phone because coming to this place. Oh, see? Something happened. Okay. Uh, any more questions? No? 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 Yes? No. Okay. Let's say thanks uh, so much to Ian Wallace with a little present and invitation to the after party. Thank and thank you for, uh, for your questions and comments. Uh, welcome to the after party. And uh, now, yeah, now is the migration time. And in, uh, it's interesting, when we started to talk about uh, system administrators, uh, interesting things started to happen here. So, we have uh, three minutes, three minutes till uh, our next speaker will start his presentation, and we'll talk about where is my data. Thomas Sturek is going to talk to us about that, but we'll start on time because of the uh, translation, as you, can, as you know. All the presentations can be seen in uh, live streaming in HD, and uh, afterwards, after today, you can also, of course, go to the website of the conference and see all the presentations on demand in HD. So that is all set. We'll have two more speakers, and then we'll have a 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes uh, coffee break, and then two more speakers. Thomas, while we, while we wait for our... Yeah, we have two minutes. You, you have two minutes to talk, uh, to, to tell me, uh, to tell us about yourself, where you, where you come from, and uh, what is your uh, field of expertise. It's going to be on. It's on. No. Now it's on. Should be on. Thank you very much. So, hello, everybody. My name is Tomasz Turek. I actually come from Poland. <clears throat> and I represent Veeam Software here. So, if any of you know Veeam, not sure, anybody has heard of Veeam, knows Veeam as a company, usually the question is what we are doing here. Because this is an IT security conference, and Veeam is a, well, as we call ourselves, data management company, right? So we do backups, we do replication, we do uh, off-site, we do high availability, monitoring. So basically not something that you would consider really 
an ITSEC conference material, right? But the part of the backup that I wanted to talk to you about today is connected strictly with data. It's like putting the mindset into where your data is actually being stored. Like, do you really think about all the data you're giving out every single day? Do you think about how those companies are actually protecting their data? Do you think about how you yourself are protecting this data, right? I'll tell you a little bit about the, let's say, most interesting, I would say, attacks, hacks from the perspective of a, uh, of, uh, of myself, actually, and how they can actually impact your life. And then we'll move on how the backup can actually help you to avoid some of it. All right, now it's half past two, and uh, we can start. Um, where is my data is the main topic uh, for the next 30 minutes. Tomasz Turek is our speaker. Please, the floor is all yours. Perfect. Thank you very much. So just to introduce myself again, my name is Tomasz Turek. I represent Vim Software. And as I said, today I want to talk to you about data in general. So I will not be talking about Veeam as such for the most part of the presentation or how backup will improve your life, but just to show you how you should actually consider the data, how you should think about what you're doing in your everyday life. So this is actually a very cool map that I found. It was uh, created by Karna uh, Botnet. It's actually an illegally made map that was created in 2012. And it's a botnet that actually checked every network connected device it could reach in 24 hours. So this was made in 2012, it reached 1.3 billion network devices, right? You can see right here how it also changed during the day and night. So it's like 1.3 billion devices that probably have some storage, probably process some data, probably exchange the data between one another. So it's the 1.3 billion devices that we have to actually consider in terms of what happens if this data goes to the wrong place, what happens if this data is lost, what happens if, uh, if somebody steals this data, simply, right? When you think about how you really manage your data, you, you have your phone, you connect to the internet, you see a free Wi-Fi, you're like, okay, let's, great, let's just access it, right? But do you really think about the same things when you, for example, uh, send something online, when you have a picture? I mean, where is this picture stored? Who protects it? How does he protect it? What happens if somebody loses this picture of yours? If you send it to the cloud, will you be able to recover it? And for you, it's just like one point to another. You send something somewhere. Well, in fact, if you look at this map, it can be any of those devices actually receiving the data that you've sent. So coming on to your everyday life, you do have a cell phone. Everybody has a cell phone. And does anyone have a cell phone that's not connectable to the internet here today? There is one person. So the first point does, or two people. So the two people, you don't have to care about the first point because you're basically safe in that case, right? But you have a cell phone that's connected to the internet. You probably have it connected to some cloud service. You probably maybe have your documents also synced with your cell phone, right? So you use it every single day. Uh, you take pictures out of it. You can see right here, here's a picture of a Pope's visit, actually. You can also see it in every single concert. You film with it, right? You make pictures of random people, maybe pictures you never look at again, but those pictures are somewhere, right? Again, what happens if they're stolen? What happens if you lose those pictures? Perhaps it might be a little bit, well, important. You have the laptop. Again, laptop is something you use every day. You use it at work, you use it for your everyday life. So it can tell you a little bit about your habits, how you turn it on, how you turn it off, what kind of applications are you using. Again, what networks are you connecting to? Same thing, of course, for tablets. And what do you do with those, with those devices? Let's start with a very basic thing. For example, you have a company laptop. The sequencing of when you turn it on, turn it off, can tell you exactly, well, almost exactly, when you actually start working, right? If you're an office person, you don't travel a lot, I can tell that every single time you open your laptop at 9 a.m. and you close it at 5 p.m. So what does that tell me? That for those eight hours, you're there, right? You're not traveling, you're not at home, you're not doing anything else, you're simply sitting at work. So it's a little bit of a habit you can get from the very simple thing of just turning a device on and off. Second thing is a connection to the network. As I mentioned, when we see a free network, we connect to it pretty much automatically because we're like, okay, great, free Wi-Fi, especially if you're traveling. Again, we don't really think about the security of this network. We just consider that if somebody gives us a network, perhaps it's a company that we know, it is secure. But then again, this network 
can also trace you, right? So you have some positioning, even if you don't have GPS turned on, even if you have uh, mobile data connectivity turned off. Well, if you just go around switching into some networks, you know, you know the exact path of where you were moving, right? So another, again, it's an information about you. Another thing, playing games, for example, on your phone. How many of you know Pokemon Go? So the recently very, uh, very, let's say, popular game. Actually, in certain scenarios, this game was banned pretty much because there were cases of soldiers in secret bases actually catching Pokemon. And you know, there's a, uh, there's this screen where you can actually catch a Pokemon, you have a camera there, and you can actually take a photo of it. Well, technically, this photo is nowhere, right? Because you caught the Pokemon and it's out. But the truth is, do you really know that it, this, this is not used in any way at all? Second thing, Pokemon Go, again, as a game, for example, uses your location, right? You, you have to walk around, you, you hatch those Pokemon. So there is location data that's being actually processed. And this location data is also sent somewhere else. It's not staying only on your phone. How do we know that? Because they ban people for using fake GPSs. So they know that you have a fake GPS, so they have to actually process the data of where you're walking and your daily habits. So if you, again, walk every single day between certain hours, between certain locations, you can get a certain habit from a person and then perhaps use this information just like we heard in the last presentation. For example, stalking someone for a longer amount of time just to steal their possession. And of course we use social media, but this is a whole other subject. So this is a data that you willingly present. Like for example, you go to Facebook, you check in, okay, I'm in uh, DSS ITSEC in Latvia. So we know that you're at this conference. Again, we are pretty certain you're not anywhere else. Perhaps you take a picture and send it online. Perhaps this picture has geolocation. Again, another, let's say, piece of information that was given willingly by you. And because in today's conference we're also talking about the Internet of Things and how everything is connected, we can also think about the less obvious sources of information. For example, who has a smartwatch? Anybody here? So there are a couple of people who have a smartwatch. If you look at the smartwatch, it's basically a small computer, right? It can have internet access, it can have navigation, there are some uh, applications running on it, it can get your SMS messages, your, uh, your emails, for example. And do you really think about protecting your smartwatch the same way as, as you would protect your phone, for example? I mean, it's, it's just a watch, right? Of course, there are people who think about this seriously, but most people are just like, okay, it's a, it's a device, right? What can go wrong, possibly? Another thing, you might have to look at is your car. I mean, cars are getting smarter. For example, I'm driving with my friend recently, and you know he has this uh, all, let's say, uh, boosted in terms of in terms of uh, all the features BMW. And there are a few things that actually caught my attention. First of all, the concierge services or the services in general. Like we're driving and there's a lady calling him, "Hello, hello your car told us that your oil level is low, so please change it in your in your service." So we're like. Okay, so the car actually monitored the, the car status, it sent the information, somebody got this information, processed it, and we don't know, was it safe somewhere? Maybe not. From my point of view, it's an information that's not that important, but to someone, to some larger analytics, perhaps it can be used in some other, uh, in some other way. If you look at the safety features that we have today, for example, how many, or Perhaps have you seen just how it works, the, the auto, autonomic driving, for example, or pre-collision uh, features. There are two ways of doing that. First of all, you use a radar or laser. Second of all, you, you can use cameras. If you're using cameras, you're actually getting some kind of an image. Again, you think that this image is just like real-time only, it's not saved anywhere. But in reality, we don't know, right? Is it sent there? Is it not sent there? Maybe uh, next day you just wake up, somebody installed something in your car, and they actually can get this image from your car safety features. Another thing again, anti-theft. One, one of my friends was actually going to, to regular maintenance. You know, They put his car up just to see what's going on, and then suddenly they call him, okay, so the alarm started going on, we cannot turn it off, and the key doesn't work. Why? Because he has this external service of people trying to, let's say, figure out if his car is getting stolen. And because somebody raised his car, the automatic conclusion was that it's being stolen. So he had to call a third-party company and ask them, could you please turn off the, uh, the alarm in my car? Could you please open the car? Because actually, there's just regular maintenance going on. So again, like a pieces of information, they're just flowing in between different, uh, different places. Smart cards, this is simple. Every time you just click it somewhere, you give a piece of your, again, habit, every single day habit. 
And the last thing I wanted to talk about, this is actually changing, is the home appliances. Take a, take a look at a, a fridge, a smart fridge that's connected to the internet that scans everything that you have in your, uh, in your inventory, right? It can tell you pretty much a lot about a person, right? If a person has only burgers for the last couple of years, perhaps he's not going to be healthy. Perhaps it's an information for an insurance company. Maybe you uh, maybe should start taking care of that person, right? If uh, you're suddenly buying cheaper and cheaper products, and we know it because we scan the barcodes, it gives us an information perhaps about the financial status of this person. Does, did he change his habits, or did, can he perhaps not afford it anymore, right? So those are just like tiny pieces of information, again, that you should uh, that you should consider. And this was, this was just a personal life that we talked about. But if you look at, let's say, the more general distribution of data. So for example, you go to a bank. Anything you want to do in a bank, first of all, give me your ID. Can I scan your ID? Uh, give me your name, date of birth, some additional documents so I can confirm your identity. Right? So all this data is actually being stored somewhere. Of course, we consider the bank to be a very safe place to store this data, but we don't know it, right? We just left the data, and this is basically it. Insurance companies, uh, financial institutions, again, everybody requires this data. If you look at, for example, a hospital, you go there again, they have your entire health history. So this is data that's, of course, sensitive from this perspective, not maybe of, of being costly data, but perhaps so private that it can be used to blackmail people, right? So if this data was somehow lost or stolen, I mean, you cannot really put a price on it, right? It's just a piece of data that you want to make sure that it's, that it's there, that it's safe. Go to hotels. I mean, for some of us, traveling is like an everyday habit, right? You go to a hotel, you check in. So of course, again, name, uh, last name, date of birth, nationality, uh, some document, and of course, credit card information, right? This is normal. They just want to do uh, like a pre-approval on your, on your card. So basically, again, all this information is at the hotel, and there have been numerous cases when this was stolen. So it's something, again, we should consider if we just want to give this information out uh, freely, or should we perhaps have like a special card for the hotel just with some particular, uh, particular limit. So virtually everyone has our data. Also, if you log into some websites, I mean, some websites require registration forms. Of course, they don't check the consistency of those forms. They don't check if you're telling the truth, but many people fill out the true information about you. And if you're going to some random website, I mean, do you really know how they protect their data? because it can be a huge, nice data center. It can be a single guy sitting in a basement with his computer, and the website is running there. We don't know that. Is it encrypted? Is it not encrypted? What happens if I lose this data? Is he going to use it in any way? Of course, there is this legal checkbox. Yes, I agree that you can use my data, but within the boundaries of law. But I mean, it's a checkbox, right? It's just like PowerPoint. It can take everything, right? You can write anything you want, basically. And then we go to the point of where is this data stored that we actually create. First of all, nowhere. So basically anything we do in real time, we believe that this data is not stored anywhere, right? So as I told, the car safety feature, for example, you browse the internet, you look at some pictures, and then you close the browser, that's it, right? The picture is not there anymore. Of course it's there, right? It was cached, it's probably dropped onto your local drive. Perhaps somebody else cached your activity. So even though you don't have this data, someone else already might be using it. So there is no such thing as data being absolutely nowhere. Then if you look at local devices, for example, I have my laptop, uh, I go online, perhaps I download some documents or I create a document, I close it. So, of course, I'm safe because I saved my data, I already have it, but there are two primary things that can happen. A very common scenario is that simply this laptop is stolen, just like we heard in the last presentation. There can be even guys just stalking you just to take your data. Second thing can be a network breach because you connect this laptop somewhere. Of course, every single time you connect to a network that's not protected, you never know what's going to happen. Then the second level, let's say, of protection is you have some sort of a NAS at home. So you keep it locally, and then you make a backup, for example, to your NAS appliance. Most of people feel already so safe because we have a secondary location for our data. Of course, it's much harder to have physical access to this data, but again, it's a NAS at home. Of course, there are a lot of people who actually know how to, how to protect their network, but most people don't know about different encryption times, password strength, I mean, what kind of a password is easier or harder to breach. Some don't even put a password on their network, right? So perhaps this device is still accessible to absolutely everyone. So then we go to an external, I put a data center, but let's say external storage. 
So you just ask some, some company, perhaps not yet a cloud provider, but a company, okay, can you keep a copy of my data, right? And I finally feel secure because if I'm offloading my data to a secondary location, I know that it's a company that actually knows what they are doing. Unless I put it into some search engine, okay, where can I store my data? I go to the seventh page of my search engine, I find the cheapest offer of a company I've never heard of. Again. Do I know really where this data is stored? They may have an address, they may have a data center, but I have no idea if it's really there. And this is what actually might happen. When we, when we store the data somewhere, we think about a beautiful data center. In fact, what's stopping someone from simply downloading this data onto their local computer, processing it in plain text, and just having it there sitting around, right? If you're looking at cloud, which is, which is the last option that, I, that I've left here, especially if you look at the large cloud providers, you cannot really go wrong, right? If you send it to, to Microsoft or to Amazon, I mean, those guys are professionals, so if you send the data there, the chances for losing this data or for the leakage of this data are probably the smallest, right? Because even if the center goes down, uh, they can geologically just simply spread the data into other data centers. So different levels of protection actually give you also different feelings of security, but you still have to remember that it's your data, right? If somebody else loses it, of course, you can see them, you can be angry at them, but it's still your data that was initially lost. And a couple interesting things that I found in terms of what was happening last year and this year in terms of data breaches, leaks, security problems. I found this website, maybe you can, uh, you can visit later on. It's a very cool graphical representation of the biggest data breaches that we had in the, in the last couple of years, right? So you have those bubbles lying around saying how much data was actually affected or how many people were affected by a specific breach. And out of this website and also out of other, other sources, I found a couple pieces of information that I found really interesting. First of all, in the US, we had almost 70 million prisoner phone calls which were leaked. So first you think about, okay, it's like prisoner phone calls leak, like what's the problem with it, right? First of all, it's a phone call, right? So technically it's like a communication between two people and those prisoners did not lose their citizen rights or anything like it. So there's the confidentiality of communication. Second thing, if you're communicating to your lawyer, which by law you cannot listen to such conversation even if you're a police officer, maybe perhaps this data also leaked, right? So there's a problem of us even talking on the phone, what happens if somebody is recording our phone calls and those phone calls actually leak? I mean, do we really consider what's gonna happen? Probably not. Another thing, let's go to the US, let's say presidential campaign right now, of course, not, not directly, the Trump hotels. Again, I told you about how you go to the hotel, leave the information there, right? The Trump hotels were actually hacked into, I believe it was actually still, still this year, and they had a couple thousand credit card information along with the information of the users of, the, of those credit cards actually stolen, right? So it's enough to take a loan, for example, in certain countries, it's enough to actually take the, uh, take the money off a specific credit card, right? So it's something you do every day, just leave a card at a hotel, you think it's safe, boom, actually somebody just cleaned, up your, cleaned out your account because they actually hacked the hotel where you were staying. Sensitive information, Ashley Madison, you all know the portal and what it was used for. So the idea here is that all the personal data that you had there was actually leaked out. So this is not really a financial loss to anybody, but again, just like the health records, look at the sensitivity of this information, right? The, the blackmailing potential of the people who actually got this 37 million addresses of people who were visiting the website for various reasons, right? I mean, possibilities are endless, how you can use this data. Honestly, endless. Another thing, talking about health. UCLA health records were stolen. And again, health records can mean everything, from your regular checkup to maybe your uh, some long-term uh, long sickness, uh, perhaps some, some problems which might affect your future, perhaps affect your work. Again, blackmailing potential is absolutely huge. And probably the biggest uh, way of, of blackmailing a person is having their entire life actually in front of you. And OPM, 
I'm not sure if you, if you know this company. It was a company that was doing background checks for people with top secret access in the US government, for example, like the military access, things like this. So they did, they did background checks, they stored this data. They were responsible for telling people who is allowed to actually get those certificates, access this top secret data. So even if you look at those low level access certificates, you have to give a lot of information about yourself there, right? Uh, who you're communicating with, which, what, with uh, from which country, uh, is it on a daily basis, how often do you drink, do you smoke, how often do you smoke, I mean, uh, are you having a single, let's say, relationship or are you a more open person? It's very sensitive information and the deeper you go into those security certificates, the more information you actually give away about yourself. The insurance leak, again, same thing pretty much as the health records. Everything you already given the insurance company, so all your records, let's say, of accidents, of, of sicknesses is there, plus all the data of the people who were actually even uh, kicked out, let's say, of the, of the insurance is there with, that, with the reason itself. So perhaps no other insurance company will take you anymore because they have everything in there. Going a little bit further, Ukraine power grid blackout. It's actually a denial of service attack that was ran against uh, Western Ukraine, but it was actually a result of an attack that happened, I believe it was six months earlier, right? So six months earlier, somebody got access to their systems, and then after half a year, when nobody is expecting it, because even if there was a breach, perhaps, okay, they found nothing was stolen, great, and after six months, suddenly, the power plants shut down. Just, just like that. Swift vulnerability. So this is a bit of an overstatement because Swift as such is fairly secure. But there was a case when a Bangladeshi banker was actually hacked and from his computer there were financial messages sent through Swift actually carrying out over $81 million out of a bank. Right? So technically it's something that shouldn't happen because the authentication there should be, uh, should be fairly good, right? Because a banker should not be able to just take money and just send it to some offsite location. And the last thing that I left, because it fits, let's say, my expertise the best, is the Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital. And they had a problem as a public institution of somebody accessing their data and actually putting a crypto locker on it. So they encrypted the files and said, okay, you can buy it for $17,000. So for a public institution, a hospital, I mean, such an amount of money is, is pretty huge, right? And again, this is data that might be life-saving to, to some patients, right? Of course, it's not only history, it's current treatment, things like this. And because their data was not secure, so they had no way of protecting from the attack, and then they had no way of actually recovering the data, they actually had to pay the money, right? And this is where, as I said, backup actually fits into security, because if you're attacked with a crypto locker, if you have a data, if you have a data protection solution that can actually recover this data in just a couple minutes, why bother with those people, right? Why pay the money when you can actually get this data by yourself? And we also did a survey about the cost of security, so to speak, so basically the cost of downtime in terms of exactly, as I said, like, for example, crypto locker, which basically kills your company. So as you can see right here, South Africa responded that for them annually, it's the most expensive to have downtime. And we took into account the average uh, cost of a downtime. We asked people in certain countries, we took the average number of downtimes that they have and the duration of the downtime. So you can see right here, it actually goes in millions, so Switzerland is the, is the least one with $1.3 million, which is still more than enough to kill a lot of companies if they have a downtime like this every single year. And up to South Africa, where you get over $30 million of cost every single time you have downtime. But the second thing we have to consider if you're talking about security, downtime, and not being able to recover the data is what you're really afraid of. As a brand, of course, you're afraid of losing customer confidence, right? Would you really go into a company that just had a huge data leak and you absolutely know that they are not secure? Probably not, even though they may have upgraded the security system, perhaps they have put a lot of money into it. You just don't care. You want to be secure. You want a company that has a flawless record in such, uh, in such area. If you look at, later on, brand integrity. So this is basically also connected to the first statement, like losing customer confidence. The brand itself might be already destroyed, so maybe you have to rename the company. You have to, again, spend like millions of dollars just to build up this confidence again. But the third point is actually interesting. The managers are afraid of losing their employees' confidence. Their employees confidence. 
So a company can run in crisis situations even if the clients don't believe in it, but when the employees stop believing in it, I mean, it's, it's just like a downfall, basically, of, of anything. And not only company, but if you look at social lives, if you are skeptical about doing something, you just don't put your heart in it, right? So even though it sounds like weird that employee confidence may have an effect on you, it's actually, it's actually there. So as you can see, this downtime can really impact your uh, environment, your life, your, your company. So to finish up, as I said, I represent Veeam Software. We're actually a data management company. We focus on backup, replication, uh, offsite backups, data availability, high availability of virtual machines stationed in VMware and Hyper-V environments, right? So we deal with virtualization because this is what companies are using more and more. We're also moving into the physical area with the agents that will be released soon. So even if you're not thinking, let's say, big on a company level, but you're thinking on your, on your own level of this laptop that might be stolen, that you might get this information leaked somewhere, there are tools that can help you protect from it. There are tools that can, for example, save you from ransomware. This is it from my side. Thank you very much for listening. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to hear. Thank you. No? Yeah, uh, just a second. So. Maybe, to, maybe to conference organizers, will it be possible to get presentation materials in some way? Come. turned off to your mic. Uh, well, basically, what, what you can do is uh, go on, online uh, and see all the, all the conferences, uh, recordings of all the, of, of all the speakers uh, in HD streaming, okay? So, um, yeah, good. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to Tomasz Sturek. Time for mig migration. Our, our next speaker is going to be Jerzy Mrugala, and he's going to talk about readiness for EU GDPR, securing the last frontier with Kingston Secure USPS. <laughs> well, basically, from the last speaker, we understood that it's basically uh, the safest is to live in a cave and don't communicate to anyone. Well. But hopefully, Jerzy is going to show us that it's not as bad. No, no, no. We start exactly at 3 o'clock because all the presentations are online and, uh, with a live broadcast. Yes. So the, basically, we're going to talk about the EU GDPR. In May 2018, we'll change uh, how personal data should be treated by business and what implications and challenges the new regulations will bring. And as I understand, kinks and technologies can be helpful in that regard. We have uh, nine different venues, uh, all simultaneously and uh, all watchable on the website of the conference, live in HD. So it doesn't matter how many people are in here in this room, there are many more sitting wherever in the world. Zoom in it. Yeah, as we can see, we'll have two speakers, Andres Janssons, the big boss, and Jerzy Mrogala. I'm a field engineer. Field in engineer. But big bosses cannot do anything without the field no. engineers, right? So, 
We have one more minute left. I remind our audience that we are in the DSS IT Sec uh, 2016 conference, and uh, we have before the uh, coffee break, which will be in half an hour, we'll have a, a presentation regarding the Kingston technology solutions for EU general da data protection regulation. All right, I think we can start, and uh, let's start with Andres Janssons, please. But use the microphone, please. Yeah, sorry. So. Uh, could, could you guys actually, four of you, on, sorry, three of you and one lady, do you know already about EU GDPR, general data protection? Sure. Then I would really be fast and skip, just jump over it. So basically what it is, it is uh, new regulations from European Union that uh, sort of is intended to uh, make some sort of new reg regulations how the data, personal data is treated. And um, yeah, it's coming in force in 25th of May 2018. All the regulations are done by now, so it's a, now a period of time where actually the companies or even the private guys can prepare for that. So it's still two more years to, do, to, to go. Uh, the, the meaning why it's done now, because the last regulations of uh, data and data protection and the privacy was done by Europe in 1995. So it's, well, last century. That's the first one and more than 20 years ago. So definitely there is needed much more stricter regulations at the moment and how the data are used and uh, how it will be uh, done in future. So it's do all done to purpose to actually strengthen the consumer rights, let's say, or consumer sort of protection from uh, any usage of un unauthorized usage of your personal data, meaning photos, emails, blah, 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 things like that. So, and uh, yeah, it's a modernization, of, as I told already, of 1990, 1995 data protection direction. So it's also will be spanning all across the Europe. So each European Union country will be harmonizing on that. That's quite clear. And um, yeah, the standards are up compared to what they were before. So what it actually means, it means that everything that the companies who are dealing with personal data, including photos, videos, when they are linked to any faces, and these faces can be traced back to, to phone numbers or emails or whatever, they need to, the data needs to be somehow protected. It's very fuzzy how it's done because it's, uh, it's, uh, at the moment, it's stated it needs to be used state of art protection for that. That's, that's, that's more or less it. State of art means whatever. But what we understand as state of art is just basic encryption of everything you have. And actually, the most important topic of that whole EU GDPR thing is that the pretty heavy penalties are introduced once you are once you are caught to, or uh, data is lost by your company, and uh, it could be up to the 4% of your annual turnover, which could be pretty hefty fine. I think there is some minimum, yeah, Jesse, do you know, by heart? It's uh, millions of euro, probably. Yeah, if the company is big, and actually if the sort of the international company has a branch office here, and they lose the data, means that also the head office will be punished, and that could lead to millions and even the billions. All right, so it's pretty scary. So you can report yourself the data breaches, but um, yeah, well, let's see how it goes. But so far, well, it's still not technically in place, so we still have some grace period for that. So overall, it looks quite uh, heavy regulations, so meaning state of the art, data protection, blah, 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 things like that. And um, what can you do to be compliant? There is no certification by European Union. You just need to be sort of, uh, you need to know about that. So um, what we recommend is actually to, just to understand how many of personal data you are using at the moment inside your company. And uh, 
you need, basically you need to define the strategy for that. How in the future you're going to use them, or do you really need to store personal data, and how you're going to protect these data. So there is actually two two ways. Actually, nobody is everybody is thinking how to protect emails and uh, encrypt card drives and things like that. But uh, actually, if the company has PCs, they usually there are PC ports available for usage. And uh, one 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 scenario is just a by end protection to kill all the ports. But if the company is allowing to use any USBs from 2018 25th of May, it needs all needs to be. A password protected at least or uh, yeah encrypted sorry yeah, encrypted so it also needs to be in all your stuff all everybody in your organization needs to be aware of that EU GDPR laws that even if the, it's done by not intentionally but somebody just loses the data it, it counts as a as a sort of offense and you could be penalized by that as far as I know it they are in the European Union bonds, or it's already done, that um, also the private persons would be held responsible for the use of uh, uh, data loss, which contains personal third-party data. So basically, that's a scary story so far, but we are here to help you. and. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, you can lock down all the ports, but it's, well, it's fine decision, but sometimes you really, even with the cloud options and things like that, uh, USBs are really convenient to use. Easy way how to transfer data, and still it's quite popular way. But as I told you, from now on, if it uses sensible, sensitive data, you need to be, that USB needs to be encrypted. All right, and then we run over to Jersey. Hello again. Um, thanks for invitation. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here um, with you. It's my first time. Um, what I'm going to talk about to you um, is um, a few solutions from Kingston. How do we uh, help in preparation of an EU GDPR? Uh, let me just see if my demo is still working because it's got uh, uh, 20 minutes off. Uh, okay, it's still on. So what I have to um, prepared for you today is a short uh, presentation and just a few words about the latest Kingston encrypted USBs and, uh, and a short demo as well uh, about the uh, uh, about the management uh, solution. Okay, so basically we have uh, two product lines to offer. Traditionally, Kingston is the owner of uh, data travelers. Uh, three of them, Data Travel Vault Privacy, DD2000, and DT4000 G2. Um, DTVP is uh, probably the latest product from Kingston. They all 256-bit AES hardware encrypted. And DT2000 is a keypad. Is that the good position for the camera or more in the center? DT2000 is a keypad product that, um, that actually allows you to, uh, instead of putting a, a password, you can, you can use a PIN. Uh, this brings a lot of benefits. First of all, it's OS agnostic. You don't have to worry about the operating system, Linux, Mac, Windows, NAS. Uh, or TV, it will all work. It's encrypted. If you mistype your PIN 10 times, the data uh, encryption key is gone. So next time you want to reuse it, you have to format it. And DT4000 G2 is a military standard grade um, military drive. It's FIPS 140-2 uh, level 3 certified. Um, Okay, let's uh, move the other direction. Uh, and another product line is linked to Iron Key. Iron Key and Kingston Technology is one company from the beginning of the year. Um, there was, uh, I, have a, I have a few business managers who kept telling people that Iron Key was rubbish, 
when we didn't own it, now when we own it, we keep telling that it's a great company. So, um, <laughs> but the, truth, the truth is, um, you have to respect your competition. IronKey brings uh, a few more things to the equation. First of all, it's uh, encrypted uh, management console, which I'm gonna demonstrate next. Um, the IronKey D300 is a brand new product. It's a legacy of IronKey and the best out of Kingston. Uh, it brings um, huge capacity, good speed. Uh, it brings uh, military grade uh, certification, a FIPS uh, certification. Uh, digitally signed firmware means that um, the drive is immune from the bad USB problem reported a few uh, years ago. Um, reformat, so it's all encrypted. It will lock after after um, ten wrong uh, attempts. Uh, and it has a managed version as well. Uh, so one more time, it's it's pretty heavy. I don't know if you guys visited us at this tent, but it's it's probably you know you could damage somebody's um, skull if you if you accidentally hit somebody. It's it's a really heavy duty drive, waterproof. Um, and, and a fast product, tamper evident uh, with a, a epoxy inside. Um, this is an iron key management console. Kingston doesn't actually have any management software. We rely on our data uh, locker partner. They run two uh, management uh, softwares, uh, Safe Console and uh, EMS. That's EMS, which I'm gonna demonstrate in a moment. And that's a safe console, which I, I cannot demonstrate because we cannot go online at the same time with my own computer. Uh, a few companies we work close together in terms of management. Um, big guys uh, really care about um, encryption and, and management. Uh, so just a few names, maybe they ring the bell. Um, and a few words about two management solutions. So management actually can do a few things for you. It can get all the drives, uh, encrypted drives together, uh, create groups, create policies, disable drives, reset the password without data loss, and so on and so forth. So the two uh, solutions we offer um, with, uh, in conjunction with Data Locker Partner is uh, EMS and Safe Console. Now, they have plenty of features, but uh, most important difference is uh, Safe Console integrates with Active Directory, which can be helpful for many admins. Um, that's, uh, it's stated over there. Um, and yeah, you can actually remotely um, reset the password with Safe Console by calling somebody. So if in the middle of, uh, of work, in the middle of the night, we lose our password, we forget 10 times or, or nine times, we want to reset without um, data loss. We, we could call administrator and if he successfully or she successfully identifies the user, they can with help of challenge response uh, system reset the password. And I think from the presentation, that's it. I just wanted to show you quickly how the, um, the uh, management console looks like, including, a, uh, including things like geolocation. So this is the, this is the EMS, uh, Iron Key uh, Management Console by Data Locker. Um, it, would, um, it would manage users and devices. Let me see if it's still if it still works. So that console requires an admin drive. Um, the, uh, so there is a requirement to have at least one admin drive and one client drive. Um, you can create many different policies um, and manage the users. Uh, you can see uh, what kind of users I've, we've created here. That's myself, that's a friend uh, working right now in Finland. Um, there's uh, many different policies you can create. And how does it look like from the management of policy point of view? Here is a, uh, let's say, three different, four different policies. Let's walk into 
uh, one of them. So basically, very important um, aspects of creating a different policy for different group is, is, is that you can actually um, identify and, and control things like maximum password, password length, um, the requirements as to the uh, password, um, and you can also um, uh, manage some some other things like onboard software, uh, secure backup. You can see not all the functions are applicable to all the drives. Um, Ironkey had a, a long list of products. Kingston, when we took over, we um, simplified a little bit the palette. Uh, so one of the interesting ones is a silver bullet um, policy that, um, that actually can kill the drive uh, if it gets stolen. Um, the device recovery, uh, password reset, or remote detonation. Um, the remote detonation is, is uh, not that it explodes in our pockets, which it's kind of cool, but it may be dangerous, but it basically damages the firmware of a, dr of a drive and it makes this, uh, it renders it unusable. Um, a few more things to, uh, like, like automatic lock after whatever time parameter we choose, force lock, uh, users can configure the, the settings or not. Um, so that is the data locker EMS. Um, we also, uh, for the other product line, for the data travelers, we also use Safe Console and other management uh, software owned by the data locker as well. So depending on which hardware you own, you can either uh, don't, you can either not use any management software, you can use um, uh, EMS or you can use the uh, um, Safe Console. So that's basically the management demo. Uh, the drive itself um, uh, authenticates, what, when we authenticate itself to the drive, um, it opens up a data partition and, uh, and the drive would be visible as IronKey secure uh, files. Um, I could maybe demonstrate how, it, how we authenticate uh, take younger drive out. Um, Lug it back in, um, and basically um, open the files. What you can see here is just uh, one partition for the Iron Key Unlocker. The data is not visible anywhere. Uh, it works with Windows, Linux, and 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 Mac as well. Uh, we have to authenticate yourself to the drive, of course, and. Uh, and you can actually create a um, read-only partition if you want. So that's another that's another feature customers asking for. Can we have a physical switch that makes a device read-only? There's no need for that. And why? Because we can actually make the data partition read-only. Uh, so that's the moment we authenticate uh, authenticate correctly to the drive. The data partition is mounted, and the drive is visible and we can copy and then paste data. Uh, of course, the user user guide is um, uh, PDF is also present. This computer doesn't have a PDF reader, so we're not able to open it up. But that's basically how it works. Uh, and I think uh, I think that's end of the demo and the presentation. I wanted to show uh, um, the other demo, but Safe Console doesn't doesn't work without internet access. Um, yeah, thanks very much. I hope we didn't exceed the time. Um, we uh, have a few minutes, few minutes for the questions. But if we can't answer uh, that questions now, we kindly invite you to the stand. We here all the day, um, and uh, we are happy to help. I know that some of you has uh, asked for the time of the presentation. You wanted to see us. Thank you very much for, for coming. And yeah, if you have um, any questions uh, regarding encrypted USBs, you can either um, kill us now or, or we can answer them anytime you want. Uh, the, I don't know about pricing 
but the distribution partners are all here, um, so they are happy to help immediately. Thank you. All right, any questions now? Yeah, sure. I have a question. Um, uh, let's say if police sees the Kingston flash, which is encrypted, does your company can help to encrypt it and get information out of it if it's encrypted with, with this type of uh, for security? We would love to. We would love to help. That's a good question. I think you deserve a voucher for the party. Um, and we'd love to help the police, <laughs> but we don't uh, have any means of helping them. Uh, with other words, the, um, we don't have a backdoor solution. We don't have a, a magical uh, password for the drives. So this is like a politics for company, for, uh, for, co uh, for uh, confidence, uh, for your clients. You can tell them that if it's encrypted, there is no way it can be decrypted except the password, right? That's correct. But um, also what we mentioned about the management software, the admins can actually take things in their own hands. After that, you should find who is the admin of it. Right, right, right. Copy. Sometimes you just see it and um, it's your USB, but you cannot do anything about it. Yeah, good question, though. If they own the administration uh, software, the administrator, don't forget, admins can reset the password without losing the data themselves. So they control how they identify the users. That means they have to have a policy internally. How do I identify you as a company member? Is it because uh, you know the person by physical characteristics? Is it because you know the voice? Maybe it's a lady you talk to every day, so you know her very well. Uh, you have to have a policy how you'd identify the users, but um, the uh, administration console helps at Omni server. Mm -hmm. Thank you, good question. That's a voucher, um, Andres. One more, here you go. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so, I couldn't name that a question. I cannot uh, formulate it exactly, but I'll try to raise a small discussion about that. So, uh, as far as I have noticed from the presentation, there were two ways uh, how we can get the benefit of controlling the endpoint users. So first was blocking the USB ports, and uh, the second one using the encrypted method, like the Kingston USB keys. So uh, in that sense, uh, if you are proposing to use the encrypted USB keys, so how will you control the other users? So meaning uh, who can use their own devices? Mm -hmm. So because we need to get connected different types of devices. So the same way for the USB keys that have been uh, brought from home and so on. Okay, that's another good question. Um, the solution presented and offered by Kingston is an encryption and encrypted USBs in particular. But the, each of Kingston encrypted USBs offer a unique serial number, a friendly name, and a VID-PID combination. That means that a corporate that uses endpoint protection software like Symantec, SEP, McAfee, or, or ESET, for example, I even have an ESET on my computer, in addition to encrypted USBs and encryption on board and management software, they can also blacklist and whitelist the devices based on the unique serial number, based on PID, VID, product ID, vendor ID, or based on the friendly name we used to call Kingston Drives. So you could actually uh, enforce authentication, blacklist, whitelist, uh, and, and um, characterize the devices. So the solution from Kingston is complementary to endpoint protection. Uh, by the way, do you have some integration with the Active Directory in order to enforce the policies? Yeah, so the Safe Console would have um, integrate, full integration with Active Directory. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe another small question. So uh, you showed uh, the Endpoint Console when it was possible to connect the uh, USB stick, and uh, so it was necessary to enter the password. 
in order to get connected to the encrypted drive. So in that sense, is it protected from the multiple attempts of probing the password? So otherwise, it can be quite an easy victim for the dictionary attacks. Um, I don't know the question exactly. Uh, I, I don't know the answer exactly to that question. The, we have 10 attempts uh, possible. We locked uh, the number of attempts to 10. It can be customized to three. Um, so that should successfully limit the dictionary attacks. Um, but um, so far, we didn't have a company who broke Kingston code. Uh, to, who broke into this encryption um, chip. And we've been working maybe more than uh, 15 years on encrypted USBs. Actually, there is not much competition, as much we respect competition and we, we like them because it, it only contributes to the better of everyone. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. It's actually damn hard um, to crack these uh, drives. It will take a lot of graphics card processor um, power. And by the time somebody uh, cracks the encryption, it will be the information on, on board of the USB will lose value. It will take maybe five years. And then what would you do with this information? It, it doesn't matter anymore. Okay. Another good question. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Any more questions? No. All right, then, uh, thank you so much. Here is a little Thanks. present for you. And also invitations to the after party and certificate. I think we owe the gentleman another, another okay. after party uh, voucher. Okay, that's... that's thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And now is the coffee break, 25, uh, 25 minutes. Yes, it was supposed to be 20. Uh, now it's 25. We'll see you back. Fifteen, ten minutes before four o'clock. Okay. All right. Thank you.
Welcome back to the venue four of the DSS IT Sec uh, 2016. The largest annual security conference and exhibition in Baltics continues. We have a third wave of uh, uh, speakers in the house. Uh, in the next hour, we'll see uh, two speakers uh, talking about how to secure your data uh, with uh, continuous data protection from data core software and GDPR done in Latvian style, how Latvia prepares for the changes coming up in 2018. Uh, but uh, we'll start with uh, Ilpo Vilkman from DataCore, who is going to talk about how to secure your data with continuous data protection. Okay, the floor is all yours. Let's start. Okay, thank you and welcome. Uh, so, as already said, my name is Ilpo Wilkman and I'm the regional manager for DataCore software in the Nordics and Baltics. So, let's start. So, this is the agenda. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, who is DataCore. I'm going to talk about the threat potential with ransomware. I'm also going to go through the classical countermeasures, how you usually do when you, when you run into into ransomware, and then I'm going to talk about a feature in our product, which is called um, continuous data protection, and describe a little bit how that what that is and how that works, and also obviously how that's going to help you to to get rid of ransomware. So let's start by talking a little bit about DataCore. Uh, so we're an American company. We've been in the IT industry for, uh, in business for 18 years, uh, and uh, we're on the 10th generation of product. We have a pretty large customer base in the world, so we have uh, 
plus 30,000 deployments worldwide. And uh, we have all different industries and different sizes of customers. So uh, what we're doing is a technology called software-defined storage or storage virtualization. So that's the main business that we're doing. So we're not a tra traditional security vendor, but we do tap into some of the functionality or some of the things that is important to protect your data, so which is for uh, data security. So our slogan is the data infrastructure company. And uh, that is because even if we do software-defined storage, that's not all we do. We actually uh, we work also with the servers. We increase the performance and we give increased functionality and all that. So, so we're in the whole entire stack working from the storage up to servers. <clears throat> so data core, this is a picture of what we do. So data core, we're a software vendor, so we sit on top of the hardware uh, so it can run in a hyper-converged solution which we call virtual SAN and that means that you're running everything in the same server. So you have the compute, you have the networking and you have the storage, everything in the same box everything running there as a hyper-converged solution. Then we also have something called SAN Symphony V, which is the other product, and that is when you're running your ex uh, on dedicated data core servers, which are like storage nodes managing your storage. So then you in attach something, uh, external storage, and present, uh, uh, and use it with data core, and we present it as virtualized storage to the application servers. <laughs> And you can also add to this, so with the hyper-converged and with the traditional way of doing storage, you can always have some storage which is out in a, at a cloud vendor. So we have integration with cloud vendors, so it doesn't matter where your storage is located. If you're running data core on top of it, it doesn't matter. We manage everything from one single console. And for us, it doesn't matter if it's virtualized, uh, virtualized hosts or if it's physical hosts. So it can also be VMware, Microsoft, KVM, or whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference for us. We just present the storage to those hosts uh, as normal storage. And the benefits you get when you're using Data Core, we obviously take all these resources that you present to Data Core, the hardware resources, we pool them together and uh, protect them, which means that we create the pool, virtual pools out of the, whole, uh, the hardware and we protect it so you get high availability, you get always continuous access to your data, you don't lose data, uh, your access to your data and you don't lose your storage. So if, if you have storage on different locations, if one of the sites goes down, it automatically fails over to the other side and uh, there's no downtime for the applications. <laughs> And as I already said, we centralize, so everything is managed from one single console, but we also accelerate the performance for, these, uh, for, for, for the storage. So we actually broken some world records in the price performance category we, uh, with, uh, with some of uh, uh, our products. So we run it both on hyper-converged and also on the traditional storage system. So we're, we broke the world record on, uh, on price performance on the highest number of uh, IOs, and also, most importantly, on the latency. We have the lowest latency ever, so with this is, compared to all other vendors, we broke the world record. So if we take a look under the hood, so what is it actually? We, we have uh, two products out there right now. We have a third one coming out, which is called Parallel Server, so which is gonna be introduced really, really soon, which is more for for performance, but uh, <laughs> the functionality that's under the hood, so obviously we run as a virtual server uh, or virtual layer on top of the hardware. So uh, we looking on the performance side, we have first of all, this what's up there, parallel IO. That is actually the functionality where we utilize the multi-core functionality in the servers and, uh, and with, <laughs> With this, we have been able to break the world record. But it's not only that, we have performance, we have high speed caching, so we're using the RAM in the servers for caching. We also have a functionality called auto tiering. 
So we have the most granular auto tiering out there. We have up to 15 tiers of, of uh, auto tiering that you can tier between different types of storage or, or storage systems or different types of disks. We also have something called random write accelerator. And what that means is if you have uh, really write intensive uh, databases which write really small writes, write intensive, then you can take all these uh, random IOs and uh, random writes and create, turn them over to storage friendly sequential writes. So it speeds up the performance really, really well. Just by ticking that box to, to use the random write accelerator, you can get uh, SSD-like performance from rotating disk. So this is really a benefit for, uh, for databases. <laughs> then we also have a functionality called quality of service. What that means is that we can control the bandwidth that the different applications get, so nobody takes over all the bandwidth we can, so that can be controlled in the system. So jumping over first to, from, to the other side, from efficiency, we have other functionality there. So we have something called storage pooling, and that is pretty much taking all the different types of storage you have and uh, creating uh, virtual disk pools out of them and presenting it to your application. So, so the hardware is just uh, resources for your, for your environment. You don't need to have specific hardware. You can these are just the resources, and you can swap them out uh, on the fly without any downtime. So if you need to migrate or change some hardware, then you just do that on the fly and there's no downtime related to that. Theme provisioning, pretty well known in the industry, but that is, so you can over allocate uh, the storage you have, so instead of buying huge amount of storage directly or a lot of hardware, you could start with less hardware and grow, uh, buy as you grow. So you over allocate the storage that you have. Also, we have some other features for data migration, and uh, so if you're moving from one storage hardware to another, you can do that uh, transparently without having any downtime. If you need to move to another data center or whatever, it's very easy to migrate. Also, we have the functionality, deduplication and compression and such things. So, uh, all we already mentioned about the management, but we do have central management, regardless of what type of storage you have, where you have it, can be different types of disks, can be flash, it can be rotating disk, it can be something external at a remote office, it can be in the cloud, doesn't matter. Everything is managed from one single console, and we also have uh, integration into other, other systems like, or vendors like Vivo's integration, and we have OpenStack and that kind of integration with other vendors, and also into the cloud. So now getting a little bit into the, uh, the theme for today. So obviously, so software-defined storage is our main or core business, but we do tap into some of the security parts of it, like high availability, always getting access to your data. But today we're going to talk about ransomware. <laughs> Maybe you have seen some of these things pop around. Uh, so this is not unusual that uh, you can get attacked by, uh, by some malicious uh, software or piece of software that installs on your computer and uh, takes over, encrypts your data, so you don't get access to your data. And this is really troublesome because there's really, it's really, really hard to get out of this. So uh, ransomware, what is that? Well, obviously, it's a, it's a, piece of, a small piece of malicious uh, software that you get into your system from different ways, and it takes over your computer, encrypts your data, so you don't get access to your data. And uh, then, the, then uh, the criminals or the, the, the hackers or whoever has in, uh, installed this on your computer, then they require a ransom. That's why it's called ransomware, so they want you to pay to get out of it or to release your data, or maybe not to publish your data that you have. So this is really, really growing rapidly. If you just take a Google, uh, Google the word ransomware, you will see that in less than 30 seconds, you will get more than 9 million res responses to or hits on ransomware. So this is really an increasing problem. So 
ransomware, it's not only that you have hackers sitting at home doing, trying to create malicious, uh, malicious code to, to attack you or to take over your data. You actually, they don't even have to do this because there's already off-the-shelf uh, products that they can go online and purchase this, uh, these uh, r different ransomware. And there's instructions on how to do it and how to work with it. So there's, uh, they, they, it's very simple for criminals to just go and buy something, instructions and everything, and then they inject it into your uh, private systems or into corporate uh, organizations. So this is really, really growing. Uh, as it's seen before, that uh, the majority of the ransomware has been uh, targeted to, to home users, but it's increased very, very much So now on, on the corporate side. So actually, it's growing uh, about 100% year over year from, from, uh, from, from on the corporate side. So more and more organizations are getting attacked by ransomware. This is just... Uh, an illustration what types of ransomware there are out there. So, um, obviously, this doesn't really say very much to me, I, I, only that there's lots and lots of different types of ransomware. Just to make aware that the most uh, common ones are Tesla Crypt and CTB Locker. So, these are, you might have heard of some of these, that there have been large organizations who have been hit by these, and they have got into really, really big trouble because they can't access their data, they, their production stops, and they have a real hard time getting out of it. <laughs> so, there, how do you get infected? Well, there are different ways. You could get emails from different places. You could get it from your bank or from your phone company or from uh, PayPal, Microsoft, or whoever. And they want you to, they send you something, okay, you need to click here to, to update something or some other ways. You get some email and by, ac by accident you click on that and think that you're gonna do something good or they, you need to update something. What happens is that you, you get in injected by this ransomware. So uh, they take over your data and encrypt your, your computer so you won't uh, be able to use or access your data or use your computer. They might lock the whole computer. <laughs> you might also get something from Microsoft, okay? Microsoft, uh, there, there comes a mail that looks like, or information that looks like, okay, you have some problem with your computer, uh, you, need to, you, you need to click here to update something. And you click there and you think that, okay, I'm going to fix my computer because there was a problem. Well, actually, there was not a problem. They just tricked you to click a link, so you get infected. So, also, uh, all the, the browsers, they have vulnerabilities. Even if they're trying to stay be up to date and they're always doing updates and so on, but the bad guys, they're much faster. They're always a few steps f before. So they find and exploit these uh, vulnerabilities. So if you're just browsing the web or going to Google or whatever, it might be that you click on something and you d or, or you get redirected to some, some page. And just by going there, you don't even have to click anything. You get something like uh, drive-by drive by, uh, uh, attack. So, so it means that just by passing that web page, you get uh, infected from some ransomware. Also, using Dropbox-like functionality, there's, there can be harmful code. So there's many, many ways without you even knowing that you're getting infected. You, you don't need to be doing anything stupid or bad. It's just they, they are much, uh, much ahead of us. So, so even if you do it just browsing around like normal, you might get infected even if you're careful. So... The, the usual thing is that they take over your hardware, uh, hard drive and encrypt it, but they can also take over. If you connect it to some kind of network drive or some, some file share or something, then they can also take over and uh, encrypt the whole file share. So it, imagine if they come, if you get, inject, uh, get uh, some, uh, uh, some malware on your computer when you're at work and you're in connected to some kind of file share and the file share gets locked so nobody can access the data there. This would be really, really harmful. Uh, so, so, so you don't even have to be actually connected to that file share. It's enough that you have it in your, 
in your cache, in your computer, if you have the password or something, they can, they can get into, into your shares and, and encrypt the whole file share so you don't get access to that. So there, there's really caution to be made here. So it's really easy to get uh, hit by this. So the classical countermeasure of what usually is done, well, um, first we're going to look at uh, uh, what to do. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, I'll just see here, clicking too fast. Yeah, that's it. So, so if you get hit by by uh, this ransomware, so what the first thing you, you they ask you to do is, okay, you need to pay. We're going to release your data if you pay it, or we're not going to publish your data, but. You should never do that because there's no guarantee that you will get your data back or you will, they will unencrypt your hard drive. It might be, even be that they don't even have a tool to unencrypt it. They just take your money and run. So yeah, there's no guarantee if you pay the money for, for unencrypting, you, you might not even get your, your data back. So that is not a good idea. The other way around is, well, obviously, if you have done backups, the other idea or way to do it is to revert back to a backup. But then the question is the recovery point objective. It means that when did you do your last backup? How far back do you need to, uh, to revert? So how much data will you actually lose? Because it might have been one uh, half a day ago, so you lost half a production days of data. So this uh, you you will obviously be in risk of losing a lot of data if you don't have any good tool to manage this. So you have to do some kind of you know calculation: how much data do we need, will we lose, and so on. So <clears throat> also, it might even be so that you don't even have access to your backup. It might be encrypted too, so then you're in really big trouble because how are you going to revert to a backup if you're not even accessing it, if it's also encrypted? And also, even if you revert, let's say you revert six hours back with the latest backup or half a day or, or something, it might be that it takes several hours to get back up and running. So that means that you don't only lose the time or the data that's being produced for half a day, you might even lose half an, uh, yet another day because it takes time to get up and running. So explaining this little bit with the recovery point objectives and the recovery time objectives. So what this means is, I'll see if I can get the pointer working here. Okay, so what it means is if you had your last backup here, maybe it was done, you do it once a night or something, and then you keep running for half a day or something and you get hit by some ransomware here. So. Uh, so it takes a little while before you get the alerts, okay, it takes time, okay, well, hello, we're getting attacked, we, we're not accessing our data. So when you come here and you have detected that you're, you're getting attacked, then you need to take a decision, okay, what are we going to do, how are we going to handle this, so what do you do? So this is also some time that gets lost here, and it means that from, from the last backup, it goes a long time and there's a lot of data created during this time which you might never be able to recover. But also, looking at the recovery time objective, that's the other way of looking at it, it's not only how, how far back do you have to go to be, get up and running again, but how long time will it get until you have taken your decisions, how do we get up and running and, and how do we revert the data, and maybe it takes a long, long time to get up and running again. And that means that you pretty much lost maybe a whole working day or, or the data from, that's been created the whole day. So you might have lost a lot of productivity and uh, a lot of data. So backup, it's a good tool, but it's, uh, you will still lose a lot of data. So let's have a look at the functionality that I was talking about. I mentioned uh, different functionality uh, that we had in a product, but I didn't talk about CDP yet. So CDP is a functionality called continuous data protection. And what it is, it's something similar to when you look at uh, cable TV, you might be able to record a program. And so you can see that, okay, I can revert, I want to take, oh, I, start, I pause my film, I want to revert back and I want to look at any time. So this is pretty much the same, but with the data. So you can revert to pretty much any time in place. You can record up to two weeks of data and revert to any time in place with this. 
Uh, so it's very easy to go back to any point in time within seconds and also to, to just restart from there. As said, you put, you can, you're told all the time recording the data. Uh, here's your production environment and here you have a separate CDP array which records the data. So it means your production is not affected by this CDP. It's that it doesn't take bandwidth or anything. It doesn't uh, affect your production data because it's recorded in a separate array. <laughs> so, you, so when something happens, you have these time pointers so you can revert to in, within seconds to any time in, in, in place in time to, to be up and running again. Comparing the CDP functionality with what's out there. So normally, I was talking about backup. Maybe you do the backup once every night, and then you keep running, and uh, you hit some, uh, you hit some uh, malware here, some, uh, some ransomware in the middle of the day or something. And uh, then when you, back, when you revert to your latest backup, you will obviously, <coughs> you will obviously Okay, it's not gonna follow me. So you will obviously lose the data that was created here. So this is this is uh, the uh, how much data you will lose, and also it takes time to re to revert or to get up and running from restoring from the tape library. So the other way around is snapshots. It's a little bit more granular, so you do that much more frequently. So if you get hit and use snapshots. Okay, then maybe you don't have to revert as long back as you had to with this backup. Maybe you just need, but maybe it was half an hour or an hour ago you had your la latest uh, snapshot. That means that uh, you will still lose maybe half an hour or an hour of data that's been created. So still, that's not maybe, uh, maybe that, that might be critical because of your, depending on what business you're doing. So doing this with CDP, we create, we're recording all the time, so this is really, really granular. As I said, within seconds, you can revert to pretty much any time, place in time within seconds just before the, the incident happens. So, so you can start, restart from seconds before it happened when you know you have the last point with good data. So it significantly uh, reduces or, improve, or improves the recovery point objectives and the recovery time objectives. You get, uh, you, you discover really, really fast and you, you go back. You don't need to lose anything because you just go back to the seconds before it happened and, and you're instantly up and running. So you don't need to re revert a, a backup or anything. You're just uh, up and running immediately. So this is just an illustration of how it works. So obviously we're recording for up to two weeks of data, and if something happens, you can in, you can also inject good known uh, checkpoint or markers. If you have databases, maybe you want to know, okay, if I revert my database, will it be crash consistent? So you can all the time inject some markers where you know that you have really con crash consistent data. So it will be easy to revert to the latest uh, point in time when you know you had good data. So CDP, these applications. So obviously, it's independent from backup windows because this is uh, this is something that's going on continuously. It's happening all the time in the background. It's you don't need to wait for a backup window or anything. So so and obviously, it uh, improves the recovery point objectives and the recovery time objectives because you can revert just a little bit to the latest good known point and you can get up and running immediately. So also, if you have run into ransomware and you have lost some data, then uh, you could just uh, uh, send, take the, the, the data that you couldn't recover and send it for forensic analysis to some, uh, some, uh, some uh, security vendor to see, okay, what was it that hit us? Can we maybe recover this data or can we protect us from future incidents? So I'm going to speed up a little bit here. <coughs> uh, okay. So, yeah, what, already talked a little bit about this, but after getting sh uh, hit, uh, what would you do? So you would shut down the computers that have been infected, you would identify, as said, within seconds, the latest good known data, and just uh, get up and running from there immediately. So it's really, as said, multiple rollback points, so you can have the c c consistent data, so you just need to revert to the latest good known point and be up and running pretty much immediately. 
<coughs> so just a little bit to end with some uh, common sense. So this doesn't replace your backups. You still need to be, do backups. This is just an ongoing two weeks, up to two weeks uh, recording data. So when you get new days, so it will empty out in the background and it will fill up in the, in the beginning. So, so you still need to do your backups as normal. This is just to protect you so you can revert exactly to any time and place within two weeks. And uh, well, it doesn't create any break in media. That means that you don't need to change or go, send your data to some tape library or, and then revert to any tape library because everything is in the same place all the time. It's on your, on your CDP array, so it's immediately accessible. And it also doesn't replicate data to any disaster recovery site. If you have a resource recovery site, you still need to uh, replicate your data there. So, and it doesn't replace common sense. So, I see I'm starting to get to the end, so I need to finish this off with a summary. So, uh, ransomware, uh, it's not a myth, it's out there, and it's really, really growing year over year, uh, really rapidly. And this is for criminals to take over your uh, data and get money from it. So you need to... <coughs> So, so it's a local threat, it's, it's, it's for your uh, servers and uh, your computers. It takes over and, and uh, encrypts it. So never pay money to the to hostesses, you, will, you, won't, you won't get your data back. And also, most important, create awareness with your users so they don't click on links and stuff and, uh, and uh, don't do anything stupid. So awareness among users and to get a really good uh, solution for recovering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ilpo Wilkman. Um, just a small certificate and a present from organizers of the conference. Thank you. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. And now uh, we have to mention May 2018 again because that will be the time when uh, uh, changes will take place how personal data should be treated by businesses. How Latvia is getting uh, ready for the change? Well, Arnis Spokes is uh, the personal data protection of officer who is going to tell us about that, right? Um, just one thing for, for all the participants, please fill out the form where you evaluate the conference. And at 6 o'clock, there will be, uh, yeah, the, the results will be analyzed and finalized. and. Some, somebody can also win some great prizes as well. But uh, please, uh, Arne Spooks, the floor is all yours. Let's see, we have the Yeah, most of it. Uh, so, once more, uh, my name is Arne Spukst, uh, I'm personal data protection officer and I will try uh, to introduce uh, you uh, with uh, some uh, interesting um, things from my experience in uh, general data protection regulation, uh, how to prepare. So, uh, content. Uh, I'm not uh, going to give you answers how to do or uh, traffic. I just uh, give you some hints on how to prepare. Uh, and uh, mm, the important thing, uh, what can you do now in uh, late uh, 2016? <clears throat> so uh, general data protection impact on controllers uh, actually is nothing scare. Because uh, actually, it's not a revolution. It's just a, an evolution. And uh, if controller meets all the legislation, no, there are no reason to worry. Because uh, controller are ready for uh, general data protection regulation at least in 90%. Uh, but 
bad. Of course, uh, th this this big bad. The problem is that since 2009, and why 2009? Because uh, that is uh, the time when I started uh, uh, to do business in uh, data protection as officer. Uh, so it was hard uh, and is still hard to find controller who meets all legislation in 100%. And uh, that's why to be ready for general data protection, controller must do some homework and must do it now. So, uh, as I promised, Heinz, uh, hint, a uh, hint one, uh, you must ke clearly understand your situation. First of all, understand uh, if you are processing personal data at all. Maybe you are not. But uh, uh, if in organization uh, there, uh, there is one uh, employee, then you are controller and you are processing data. There is no uh, big difference. You have one uh, data subject or uh, 10,000 data subject. You are controller in both cases. So uh, if you uh, know all, uh, do you know all personal data which you are processing? Why is this question is important? Uh, in my practice, there is uh, such uh, stories as Deep in uh, file system, there is one Excel file. Maybe there is personal data, maybe not. And it's uh, not only one controller, only one case. It's uh, almost uh, in every every case when uh, when we starting to audit controllers. And uh, yes, data storage is also data processing. If you hold file where, uh, which con consists uh, with uh, data subject uh, data, you are controller, you are uh, making data processing. Uh, this is very important. Uh, you must know very well uh, why you are processing all the data. So uh, purpose of uh, data processing is very important. And uh, if you don't know why you are processing these data, then delete them. You don't need them. Because if you are uh, going to uh, process uh, further without purpose, without uh, purpose uh, which you know, you are uh, making uh, illegal. <clears throat> after after you know purpose of processing data, uh, you must know uh, and identify legal basis to process personal data. You cannot take personal data without legal basis. Legal basis can be agreement, uh, legal basis can be law, but without legal basis, uh, you do not have rights to process personal data. And this is practical problem, because uh, in some cases, uh, this uh, personal data uh, historically is from uh, 2001 and uh, even uh, 90s, and, and there is problem, find a legal basis. <clears throat> and when you done with this, you have to map all data processing purposes with the legal basis. This is, uh, of course, hint, but without understanding your situation, it's almost impossible to be ready for general data protection regulation. Uh, and hint two, and do you trust your systems? Uh, general data protection uh, regulation defines the obligatory use of data protection by design, uh, regardless uh, of the data processing system used. And the 
uh, term system is not just an IT system. When you are processing data, uh, even if you doing this uh, on paper, this is system. And how in paper-based system you meet uh, this uh, data protection by design? It's a very interesting question and very big challenge, actually. Because you can uh, modify IT system to meet these criteria, but uh, when you processing data based on paper, it's really hard to uh, make these changes. And of course, data protection by design includes information security but not only information security. But if your system is not secure, then you do not meet these criteria. Hint uh, number three. Do you trust and know your partners? Controller can have partners, and in uh, most cases, controllers has uh, have partners and uh, this partners is data processors, or in local uh, Latvian uh, version, this is a data operator, but it's the same, data processor, data operator. Uh, and uh, of, once more from my uh, experience, uh, when I ask controllers a question, do you trust your data processor? Yes. Uh, why you trust your data processor? Because of contract. We can, in paper, in contract, uh, write down everything. Do you check your data processor? Or uh, data processor uh, says that everything <clears throat> what I've done uh, doing in-house is my trade secret. So you, as a controller, cannot check your data processor. But as uh, we all know, controller is uh, main uh, controller is uh, main responsible uh, for data uh, protection. If something is wrong, uh, data state inspector will go to controller and uh, uh, fines must pay data controller. Of course, in general data protection uh, regulation, there is some changes in that uh, algorithm. So uh, controller uh, will ha have rights to uh, to show that uh, he is not responsible for that uh, uh, data breach. The, uh, what uh, did uh, data processor, but if you do not check your data processor, how can you say that you are not responsible? So uh, this is time uh, for uh, new agreements. If uh, your data processor says that uh, everything uh, that uh, he do in house is trade secret, find other data processor who understands that controller must not only uh, have rights to check, but must check. So the right to verify the data processor is obligated. <clears throat> and uh, hint four, uh, do not wait. Uh, it's not a bad idea to start the evaluation of the situation immediately. So tomorrow, for example. Because the sooner you understand the situation, the more time you will have to avoid problems. The fact is, until 25th May of uh, 2018 is only uh, 576 days, and the counter is counting down. And uh, once more, the hard exercise understand current situation, because it's a base to prepare for general data protection. 
Okay, and uh, if you have any complex questions, please ask in written form, because complex questions uh, need uh, very deep investigation to ask, uh, to answer. And uh, if some questions uh, no, then uh, please in local language, but uh, simple questions. Thank you. Well, if 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 I can, I can I, I can uh, t help you translate. But if you have any questions <coughs> now, no, no, okay. okay. Uh, so thank you, Arnes Books, for for telling us how Latvia is going to uh, get ready for the big changes. And with this, uh, we conclude all the uh, events here in the venue four of the DSSIT sec. 2016 uh, conference, the largest annual security conference and exhibition in Baltics. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the speakers and also a certificate and a small gift to our last speaker here in venue four, Arndt Spokes. Paldies. Thank you. Thank you. And please, all the participants, fill out the form uh, which was provided in, in the bags in the kids. Uh, uh, there and um, when you have filled out the form please bring it to registration and they will at six o'clock uh, see who has won some uh, great gifts so stay, stay tuned and enjoy the rest of the conference thank you